necessary requirements to start the meeting. Um, unfortunately, as we start the meeting, we start with the set note of the um, Chachas Fontaine uh, disaster incident where the now is even a report of a loss of lives in the area. And I think as a committee, we should extend our condolences to the bereaved families at this hour, but also at the same time pledge our solidarity with those who have lost a lot uh, in terms of their properties and other uh, um, related material issues. Without any further delays, can that issue, by the way, let me say we will deal with it in terms of what is suggested as an intervention from the committee side. We know that um, the executive, starting from the president, and um, today we are informed that even the minister and the deputy minister are visiting the area. We will then be able to share with honorable members uh, what uh, is proposed as an initiative from the side of the portfolio committee, and then subsequently, what also are the developments with regards to the area? Chairperson, are you still around? Well, members, I'm trying to phone chair and find out what is the issue. Chairperson, are you in? Yes, I, I'm not sure at what point was I cut off. Or must I start afresh? You were cut off, Chair, when you were saying the committee will deal with the issue of your husband. Oh. oh, okay. No, I was just saying probably here we will give an update and what is suggested as, areas, uh, as a form of... Um, a committee program with regards to that uh, when we deal with the correspondence. Then I was looking at the apologies that uh, have been received or tendered to the meeting. Okay. Good morning, honorable members and our guests. I received the following apologies. Mr. Mailem is attending Section 194 meeting. And uh, Mr. Zungula is going to start in that meeting and join this meeting later. And then an apology from Mr. Lorima is going to leave this meeting early. And then the apology from the minister and deputy minister who are attending the issue of your husband. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Mr. Kotze and Ayanda, can we then flag the the agenda for today? Yes, we are getting a briefing uh, from the AG with regards to <clears throat> performance audit report on the rehabilitation of the relict and ownerless mines. And then we'll get uh, a briefing subsequently from the Human Rights uh, Commission with regards to um, uh, recommendations on issues and challenges in, the, in relation to the unregulated artisanal underground and surface mining uh, activities. And then we will deal with the correspondence. Um, <clears throat> AG, are you in the house? Greetings, Chair. Um, it's Kivesh Lachman here from the Auditor General's Office. I am the Business Unit Leader for Performance Audit. With me, I have Krishna Janssen van Rensburg and I have Guillermo Leroux. Krishna is the is the senior manager lead on the audit. Um, Chair, so we are we are ready for you when you are. And greetings to all the committee members also. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, the Human Rights Commission, are you present? HRC? It doesn't look as if they're in yet, Chair. I'll just check with him. Oh, oh, they, 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 no, no, no. Maybe they look at the timing that will come in to closer to their time. Um, no, we, we just needed to welcome them. Welcome, uh, AGSA. Uh, thank you very much. Can I, without any delays, because this is a matter that uh, the committee continues to be seized with, even this coming weekend, this is one matter that we have been dealing with, but um, from a different angle uh, with regards to the actual activities. Um, and, and, and therefore, we think that uh, we let's give that opportunity so that you can open up more of um, the understanding and the uh, guide and assist uh, members of the portfolio committee on how to deal with matters of this nature going forward. Can I give in now then uh, the platform to the AG? Thank you, Chair. Uh, while I'm doing the Greetings and introduction, Krishna. We'll just flag the slides. You'll let me know when you're considered. Um, once again, greetings to the Honorable Chairperson. Greetings to all the Honorable Members. And greetings to all others present with all protocols observed, Chair. I will, I will continue with the presentation. Is the slides being visible by all the participants? Okay. okay, I'll take it that the slides are visible. Shall we start off with our mission and vision? As the Auditor General of South Africa, we have a constitutional mandate, and as a Supreme Audit Institution of South Africa, it exists to send our country's democracy by enabling our oversight, accountability, and governance in the public sector through auditing, thereby building the public confidence. I think here yeah, the key one for today is enabling our oversight. We take this as a very important uh, function of the organization, and we are extremely deliberate in making sure that we are in a position to enable oversight in the functions of our oversight. Our vision is to be recognized by all our stakeholders as a relevant Supreme Audit Institution that enhances public sector accountability. Okay, moving to the next slide. Chair, I will share the mandate of, of the AGSA and the portfolio committees. As the AGSA, we see our mandate Coming from the Constitution, Section 188, we say the AGSA must 
audit and report on the accounts, financial statements, and financial management of government institutions. This mandate is also driven by the Public Audit Act, Section 20, Section 51A, A, and Section 53. For the portfolio committees, we say the national it is we say it's governed by the National Assembly Rule 227, and we say the portfolio committees may, amongst other things, perform the following functions, deal with bills and other matters falling within their portfolio, as referred to them in terms of the constitution, legislation or rules, or by a resolution of the assembly. Maintain oversight of their portfolios of national executive authority, including the implementation of legislation. Consult and liaise with any executive organ of state or constitutional institution, monitor, investigate, inquire into and make recommendations concerning any such executive organ, organ of state, constitutional institution or other body or institution, including the legislative program, budget, rationalization, restructuring function, organization structure, staff and policies of such organ of state, institution or other body or institution. Consult and liaise with any executive organ of state or constitutional institution. So we've included this slide, which gives you the gives you a, a, a good picture of the ecosystem that we operate in. And if we look at this, we say the portfolio committee plays an extremely important role in ensuring that we have the ability to influence um, and exercise insights, get insights and share these, and then also exercise enforcement. At the end of the day, we want to have an active citizenry and we want to be able to position our messages to, to show a direct correlation and direct and deliberate impact uh, of the activities on the citizenry and how it affects their daily lives and how it affects their lives and how we as these different institutions can come together to improve that role uh, uh, to improve the life of our citizens and make sure that they live a better life and a progressive life so in the next slide we describe what we understand is the role of oversight. And yeah, we say it's to use information in audit reports on material irregularities for accountability and oversight purposes, insisting on timely implementation of recommendations. Again, coming to the enforcement side in the previous slide. Use reports tabled on program, uh, use reports tabled on progress with material irregularities to oversee and influence the progress made by public bodies with investigations and executive authorities for the recovery of debt. Hold the executive accountable for failures in your control environment. Follow up on actions taken against officials responsible for transgressions. So obtain the reports on investigations conduct into transgressions on irregularities and affecting entity. Follow up annually or previous commitments made by accounting officers. Determine if corrective steps are taken to address shortcomings in internal control environments and inquire what training and support is given to officials to enable them to correctly execute their responsibilities. Chair, before we go into the audit um, and, and provide you with the overview and um, on the audit that was conducted. I will now introduce my senior manager, Krishna Danso van Rensburg, who has been the lead uh, on the audit. So thank you, Chair, for your time. And again, thank you for the to the committee for hearing me. Uh, Krishna, if I can hand over to you, please. Um, thank you, Kavesh. Good morning, Honorable Chair, members, or other in the House. Um, I'm going to quickly just give you a background first in terms of the audit process. I think, I think you are quite familiar with a financial audit. 
But in terms of a performance audit, we look at the affairs at a specific department totally different. So during a performance audit, we evaluate that measures that was instituted by management to ensure that the resources have been procured economically and are used efficiently and effectively. So the focus is basically on those three E's. So if we unpack the different three E's, in terms of the economy, uh, economy, we are talking about acquisition of resources in the right quantity, the right quality, right time, place, and at the lowest possible cost. Uh, when we focus on efficiency, we are looking at the optimal relationship between the output and the input. So we can either look at a standard output by minimizing input, or we can look at a standard input by maximizing output. Mm -hmm. Then in terms of effectiveness, uh, we look at the performance in relation to predetermined policy objectives, operational goals, and other intended effects of the audited entities. If I come closer to this specific audit, our focus of the audit was um, looking at the pro to determine whether the process for the identification and the rehabilitating of derelict and ownerless mines was done timely and cost effective to minimize the social and environmental impact. Now, as the Honourable Chair has mentioned, this is a follow-up performance audit. So initially, the first performance audit was conducted in 2009. And uh, part of our audit standards require us then to go and perform a follow-up in terms of the previous audit that was done. So for this follow-up performance audit that we have done and concluded on in 2021, uh, we focused on determining whether the progress that was made by the department since 2009 was sufficient or whether we still have the same situation or findings and then from there unpack what gave rise to the specific findings or situation that still exists. So if we are quickly looking at the progress, I'm not going to spend too much time on this specific slide. Um, it is just giving you what management have committed to as part of our 2009 audit and what is our uh, uh, progress to date. So if you have a look there, you will see there were seven commitments made by the department at that stage. And um, we're just quickly going to highlight it. We will go into the specific findings during later slides. <clears throat> In terms of the first one, at that stage, there was not a formalized and approved national strategy. Since 2009, they did sign off the national strategy in December 2009. However, no subsequent review was performed to determine whether this national strategy is still sufficient in terms of what we want to achieve. Secondly, serious efforts will be made <clears throat> to implement the national strategy effectively and to rehabilitate the DNO mines. Um, the department did compile an implementation plan. However, the implementation plan was not costed and did not include all the key deliverables as per the national strategy. Uh, specifically, we're referring the, to other high-risk commodity mines outside of asbestos and different inland use. Number three, high-risk commodities are identified and listed in the national strategy and the ranking process will give guidance for future implementation of rehabilitation projects. So the ranking was finalized. However, the implementation plan does not include any high-risk commodity mines as currently it only includes the um, closure of holdings as well as the rehabilitation of abandoned asbestos mines. <clears throat> and then there was also no risk ranking done for 2,238 of the 6,100 DNO mines as the department did not confirm liability yet. 
Number four, DMR e committed to timely update and integrated DNO database with other databases. Um, during the 21 audit, we determined that the database uh, was not continuously updated and reviewed, uh, which gave rise to a risk in terms of accuracy and completeness, and the database was not transferred from CGS to enable integration with other databases within the DMRE um, environment. In terms of number five, foreseen expenditure and capacity of mineral regulation bronze identified as a priority and a current human restructuring of bronze insufficient. Um, the other department um, did appoint to implementing agents, the two public entities being uh, CGS and Mintec to assist in managing the DNO mines. And uh, we've also found <clears throat> that we could not confirm the completeness and effectiveness of the rehabilitation during our audit of certain of the rehabilitation projects. The number six, appropriate appropriation of funds for such reprioritization will be requested. There was annual appropriation that was established for the management, which includes the monitoring of these already uh, rehabilitated mines, uh, but the current levels of funding is insufficient. Then lastly, include a standing agenda item for DNO mines at the future meetings of the government task team for mine closure and water management, as we know at the GTT. Um, <clears throat> Unfortunately, during the 2021 audit, we found that the terms of reference for the GTT was not approved. Um, the um, managing of the NO mines was still not included as a standing item, and the committee did not have frequent meetings held. Um, what the department did do is they also established since the 2009 audit, the Rehabilitation Oversight Committee, or the ROC, um, that will facilitate um, sufficient implementation of rehabilitation between the three parties being CGS, Mintec and the department. However, that terms of reference was also still not being approved and um, the committee also did not function effectively. So if we go into the key observations, um, our overall audit question, we answered it by saying that the rehabilitation of the NO mines was not done in a timely and effective manner to minimize social and environmental impact. So if we quickly focus on the graft on the left-hand side, you will see that we have divided it into asbestos mines, holdings, and then other high-risk commodity mines. So when we did our 2009 audit, if we focus on asbestos mines, there were five mines that was rehabilitated. Since 2009 up to 2021, there was another 27 mines being re rehabilitated. However, what this picture is telling us that is there's still 229 asbestos mines that needs to be rehabilitated. And if we compare the rate of rehabilitation from 2009 with the rate of rehabilitation up until 2021, there was only a minor improvement from 1.67 mines being rehabilitated per year to 2.25 asbestos mines being rehabilitated per year. If we quickly focus on the holdings in the middle, you will see this 1,170 high-risk holies being identified, of which the department already closed 507 of them, or equating to 43% of the total population, leaving them with 663 high-risk holies that still needs to be closed. Then in terms of the last pillar, the 2,322 other high-risk commodity mines, since this program has started, none of these other high-risk commodity mines was rehabilitated. So that is also an area where there's quite a bit of work still ahead of the department in doing the research on what will be the best way of closing them and, and also um, talking to the, the, the mining 
the mining owners which are in the same situation than what they are in how will it be done more sustainably. To the right hand side, that graph is just giving you a misalignment in specifically focusing now on asbestos mine rehabilitation. So if we if we have a look at the valuation report target date, that valuation report was done the 31st of March 2021. According to that valuation report, it will take the department up until 2033 to rehabilitate these remaining 229 asbestos mines. But if we compare the annual budget allocation, it will take the department up until 2043 to be able to rehabilitate the 229 asbestos mines. If we have a look at the MINTIC three year cycle implementation plan, so in other words, MINTIC is doing the rehabilitation on behalf of the department. And if we compare that rate that they anticipate that it's going to take, it will take the department up until 2090 to rehabilitate the asbestos mines. Now, if we take the actual rate, and remember, I just uh, referred to it earlier as being 2.25 mines per year, it's going to take the department until 2123 to rehabilitate the asbestos mines. And that you need to see in the context also of taking it back to the other high risk um, commodity mines, which were not at all then addressed at that specific stage. So what we did during our audit is we said, let us group the key contributors to the deficiencies. And I'm gonna quickly go through the slides because everything will be in the detail later on. We identified four key contributors. The one is leadership and oversight, funding, intergovernmental coordination, and then contract management and operations. So let us go into the detail. So in terms of leadership and oversight, the key deficiencies that we have identified is the lack of strategic importance to reduce the high number of remaining BNO mines. First one on the list is the outdated national strategy. The national strategy should have been reviewed every five years to make sure that it is still aligned towards the objective of what the department has set for themselves. In terms of the implementation plan, we already alluded to that as well. The implementation plan was not costed and it was not aligned to all key outcomes in the national strategy. So in that implementation plan, one would have expected to see that there's allocated responsibilities, timeframes, resources being allocated to make sure <clears throat> that all the strategic initiatives that are included in the strategy has been brought forward to the implementation plan. Then in terms of the national mine closure strategy, that strategy has not been finalized 11 years after the implementation of the national strategy. And it was already included as one of the key initiatives in the national strategy. So what is really making this national mine closure strategy so important is because it is focusing on different inland use. So what it is saying is rehabilitation is not the only option. We can also consider alternative use of lands that can include um, uh, for recreational aspects or it can be for economic development or for a residential area being established. And we must also see then the link that if we, if we can reduce the 6,100 um, mines that needs to be rehabilitated, um, to a lower number, it will mean that the liability of government will be reduced as well, because as soon as we identify different inland use, um, ownership will be transferred and that new owner will be responsible for maintaining the site. <clears throat> Between 2011 and 2012 and 2018-19, the department reported on the rehabilitation of both asbestos mine sites 
and our holdings under one measure in its annual performance plan. So if you report under one measure, it is not visible to the readers which specific aspect, whether it's the closure of the holdings or whether it is the rehabilitation of asbestos mines that might be slow. And you would have remembered now two slides back when I said to you 43% of the holdings has already been closed. So if you see a higher number of progress, you assume that it is 50-50 on both sides. And however, that was not the case in this regard. So there was a much higher number of holdings that has been closed and then the reader couldn't identify the slow progress on the rehabilitation of um, of the uh, um, asbestos mines. And then currently, and that was when we did the audit, the MRE three and five year plans do not include the rehabilitation program. We do understand that everything should not be included in there. But um, as you will see, when we get to the recommendation, the biggest portion will be for the department to determine the strategic importance of this program and how it will be facilitated rather than making sure that we achieve our objectives at the end of the day. Then government's liability to its 2,238 identified DNO mines has not been uh, finalized. So if you take into account the 2,200 <coughs> and 38 identified mines, it's a substantial portion of the 6,100 mines. And included in this 2,238 mines is mines with mineral rights. It's also operational mines, and it is mines that is located on, on, on private land. So it's a process that the department should go forward with and finalize it because it will also impact at the end of the day on the liability of government in terms of funding being available to rehabilitate. Then the last but not least key requirements of national strategy not included in the performance contracts of, of the responsible officials. Now within the accountability um, life cycle that we all looking at. It is very important that we need to break it down in that ecosystem in terms of what is the roles and responsibility of the department or the entity, but as well also on, on the individuals. Because each and every level within government must make sure that they are accountable for their work and making sure as we go up in the ladder that everybody in the in the ecosystem is accountable for their work and also kept accountable once that has been established. So what we found in the audit is that that key requirements was not included in the performance contracts. And if I think about a few things, um, what what would have or what should have been included is to finalize, for instance, government's liability to its the 2,238 identified DNO mines, to also make sure that we do rehabilitate a specific number of, of um, mines during a specific year, and I can go on in terms of monitoring and research. The ROD did not fulfill its responsibility. Remember, we said that uh, the department established the ROC after the 2009 audit specifically um, to achieve a well-coordinated implementation of safe and sustainable DNO rehabilitation program. So if we say they did not fulfill their, um, their responsibility, uh, we included in detail the, the terms of reference that has not been finalized, the functions that's not being allocated. Um, they also took certain resolutions during meetings and those resolutions were then not tracked and follow up subsequently to make sure that it is actually implemented. They did not meet quarterly as indicated in the draft terms of reference and they also did not maintain and safeguard minutes in all respect. So what, what is our key recommendations in terms of leadership and oversight? 
Maka indicate that the DMRE should reassess the strategic importance of this program. Firstly, reviewing the national strategy every five years to make sure that we keep track of changing environment and then also to compile a comprehensive implementation plan to achieve the national strategy objectives. They should also determine the strategic importance of the DNO mine program within the DMRE strategic objectives given competing priorities and available funding. They must finalize and adopt the NMCS and that should then also include a policy and the implementation plan in making sure that the specific um, uh, NMCS will be implemented and tracked. Assessing, which will include the research, remember we indicated that for the other high-risk commodities, none of those has been rehabilitated, some research was already done, but not comprehensively or concluded, and deciding an approach to rehabilitate or repurpose all 6,100 months instead of only focusing on rehabilitating and closing DNO asbestos mines and holdings. So that is very important because we first need to know what is it going to cost us to rehabilitate and manage the DNO mines. And before we can do that, we need to determine what is our population that we need to cover. And only once we have taken out all of these other mines that, that might not be here, the ones where we have different inland use, then only we will know this is the real population that we are working with. And then you will see as part of the database that that is being ranked in terms of high, medium, and, and low risk. Once we determined what will be the actual funding requirements, we can then also use that, and you will see that in the next slide during discussions um, with National Treasury for funding. But we as a department first need to determine in a fixed way, what are we talking about? What is our real, real need that, that will focus on what should be rehabilitated, what can be repurposed, and which ones can be used in terms of the specific uh, other owners uh, that the liability will be reduced. Very important, the reviewing of the national strategy every five years to make sure that we are aligned to current conditions, what we see and how we can approach it. We all know when we get to a specific strategy, it is what we want to achieve. But due to changing environments, that might change. And that is what's important, that we every five year review it and say, we did review it. Yes, it might mean that we are still having the same objectives, uh, or no, it might mean that we need to change something in the way that we are doing, or that our objectives have been changed. Um, then aligning individual performance contracts of the relevant officials to the requirements of the NMCS, we already spoke about the um, accountability ecosystem and the responsibility of each and every staff member in that regard. In terms of the ROC function that should be tightened, firstly by finalizing and approve the terms of reference so that we can make sure that the oversight, that the oversight function is mandated and they know exactly what is expected from them. And then all the other uh, deficiencies that I have mentioned in the previous slide, um, we must make sure then that the ROC discharge is a responsibility and assess the success of program implementation, especially where they did take resolutions and then making sure that those resolutions are implemented by the department. Second aspect, focusing on funding, key, key deficiencies. Uh, we concluded that insufficient budget is available. We divided it into asbestos as well as the other 2,322 hours commodity mines, asbestos, uh, I'm not going to talk about. We already covered that in our graph. The other 2,322 hours commodity mines, there's currently no budget. There is a hazard research budget being available, but nothing in terms of um, the actual rehabilitation 
of this mine mines. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight is that although we have a specific budget being allocated for post rehabilitation monitoring activities, um, that budget was not based on a monitoring program and procedures. And therefore, we could not determine whether that post rehabilitation monitoring uh, budget was sufficient uh, for the work that needs to be done. Because once we have done that specific monitoring, we also need to fix whatever is wrong. Um, so it's also um, instituting the remedial action from there. Then key recommendations um, should not be seen in isolation. We should definitely link it to the strategic importance and then make sure that if we have a proper detailed implementation plan that we use that, we include it in the DMRE's five-year strategic plan should the department feel it necessary to be included in there, and we need to use that costed implementation plan to my, uh, the strategic plan and the annual performance plan to support the request for annual funding from National Treasury. Always, it must be linked to also what will be um, the, the implementation plan number that can be rehabilitated. So it's a balancing act between a different, uh, different sections within this specific ecosystem. Contract management and operations. Um, I think the first one is quite clear, lack of processes and procedures. The department also committed to put in place the processes and procedures that will guide them in terms of, of the managing of the program. Secondly, where they make use of implementing agents, that's CGS and Mintech, uh, or any other if they want to use it, it should contain sufficient detail, which is currently not there. The post monitoring activities is being done haphazardly, it's not according to a plan, and there's also no indication of what should happen if I go to a rehabilitation site, I'm busy with the rehabilitation, and then I identify additional shops. Um, what is the process to be followed. Then in terms of the DNO mine database that contained errors from our review, it's not being regularly updated. And then also from the department side, because this database is currently with CGS, but remember there's no responsibility being allocated at the moment to CGS. If I say at the moment, I'm talking at the time when we conclude the audit. Um, and therefore, they did not have the mandate really. So they tried to do an update, but it was not sufficient. You know, information was incomplete and inaccurate. Most important is that DMRE needs to take the responsibility to monitor that specific um, DNO database and make sure that it is updated. Inadequate stakeholder engagement frameworks. Um, the stakeholder engagement framework um, that was compiled by the department, which we should commend them on, it did not even not include the solutions for unsuccessful stakeholder engagement during um, rehabilitation. And one of the things that we have found there is that um, there is some of the projects, and that was at October 2021, that was put on hold and was already delayed for up to 27 months. Now, as soon as we delay a project for so long, A, you are sitting with an existing environmental risk as well as the risk on the health of the nearby communities. B, it will also lead to an increase in cost uh, because we all know cost is escalating at um, at, at the right. Um, G, before I go on to the next slide, can I maybe just quickly check how are we doing in terms of time? How much time do I still have to conclude? G? Good day, Chair. Can you hear me? Reaching out to the Secretariat. Can any of y'all hear us? Hello? Can anybody yeah, hear? 
Okay. Uh, we just wanted to check quickly on the time, just to make sure that, uh, you know, we have a bit of time management. We still got a, quite a bit of slides to go through, but we'll be directed by chair. If he wants us to continue in detail with the slides, that's fine. Or does he want us to take the slides as read that we submitted yesterday and we take questions? We'll just be guided by yourself, Chair. Hello? Looks like the Chair and the Secretary are still absent. Maybe you should just carry on. Okay. okay. No, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say that, Mr. Lori, we are not absent. I was waiting for Chair to to respond because it's on the platform. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sorry, Secretary. Should we continue or should we wait? I think we can continue, sir. Okay. Thank you. Continue. Thank you. Um, then in terms of insufficient dose rehabilitation, monitoring and maintenance for asbestos, like I already indicated, it was done haphazardly um, and not according to a specific plan or program. And then the second area that we have identified is wherever we or wherever the department did identify issues, no remedial action was taken. Now, remedial action is very important that we can A, make sure that we timely correct that deficiency and B, also to have a look and reconsider the designs that, that have been used up until that specific date to see what should be improved. From the picture there, you will see it's a deficiency that was identified by DMRE during the uh, visit in 2017. Uh, this rehabilitation was done in 2007, but up until the end of our audit, no corrective action was taken. Um, so this is still the way that it is. The, we are just going into load shedding. So if you are losing me, please just um, indicate so. And then in terms of, of the closing of holdings, there was no post rehabilitation monitoring and maintenance being done for holdings. Um, we found active illegal mining and vandalized headstone markers that were not detected and appropriately responded to. So if the department uh, did go into the post rehabilitation monitoring visits, they would have identified these. Um, the picture on the left hand side is just giving you an idea. You will see there on the horizon, there is um, some of the roofs of the building, so from the settlement. Um, this is an active mining site, and it was previously close to holding, and it's very close to, to the residential area. Like I indicated there on the left-hand side, you can actually see um, the roof of certain of the houses. Then on the right hand side, illegal mining on previously closed holding site that was close to a residential area in West Rand. Uh, you can see the numbers there. It's literally 45 meters from a factory, 230 meters from formal settlement, and then 330 meters from an informal settlement. What the department should do? Firstly, and most importantly, is to develop the processes and procedures to direct the planning, execution, monitoring, and reporting of the GNO mine program. They also need to make sure that they develop a sufficient monitoring program that will include roles and responsibilities. It will also include timelines, everything, because each and every mine should be monitored in a different way, but there should be an overall process and procedure that should guide the monitoring that needs to take place. Then they should also amend its current contracts with the implementing agents to make sure that is detailed enough. There must be a specific detailed contractual relationship. It must be specific in terms of what documents should be kept, what should be available, uh, because it's not only for the auditors, but it's also for the department to put them in a situation that they can monitor the progress. Um, it should also include the number and the frequency of monitoring activities, and then that specific contract should be monitored by the department to make sure that as soon as we identify deficiencies and we are not progressing according to plan, that corrective action can be implemented. 
Then allocation of roles and responsibilities for the maintaining and reviewing of the DNO mines database, very important that we can make sure that the information is accurate and complete. Um, the department should also revise its current stakeholder engagement framework to include appropriate dispute resolution processes that will address the current challenges of disputes between the local communities and the department about the suspended asbestos mine rehabilitation projects. In terms of intergovernmental coordination, the G GTT that did not deal with the rehabilitation of DNO mines, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. We already spoke about it. Initially, the mandate and functions um, was set by the DMRE, Department of Water and Sanitation, and Department of Forestry, Fisheries, and Environment. In the meantime, a number of other entities were also added. Um, but at this stage, the rehabilitation of DNO mines does not feature in, in, in their roles and functions. And if you have a look at the key function um, of the GTT, it is to facilitate and coordinate challenges in mine water management and mine environmental management, which includes sustainable mine closure options. And this is an ideal situation where there can be collaboration between mine entities, mine owners, and government in terms of um, should we only go forward and rehabilitate a specific mine or should we consider regional scale programs um, that we can, can uh, cover an area. Then in terms of what we expect, GTT should function, the DG should um, determine what should be in the mandate and the terms of reference, get it signed off. And then also the terms of reference um, should include responsibilities with regard to the rehabilitation of PNO mines. Okay. Then in terms of recommendations to the portfolio committees, um, we expect the portfolio committee to monitor and regular follow up with the executive authority and the accounting officer, firstly on the progress on the audit action plans implemented by the DMRE. And I'm quickly going to take you through the DMRE commitments a little bit later. And then also to monitor and review the right of rehabilitation against the planned rehabilitation right. And when, when the AG is referring to the right of rehabilitation, it also includes all the actions that needs to be taken place before we get to an actual population that should be rehabilitated. If we're talking about citizens' impact, let me just quickly pause there and see whether the chair is back uh, before I go into the citizens' impact. Uh, do we still have time, chair? Sorry, sec Secretary. Yes, ma'am. Can I continue? Continue, Chair. will tell you when to stop. You are allocated time. Continue, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, so um, you would have seen as part of the slides. Um, that Kavish focused on was also in uh, focusing on active citizenry. So from the AG's perspective, we wanted to also focus and touch on the lived experience of the citizens. And we analyzed what was the impact of these unrehabilitated DNO mines on the citizens. And um, we identified five areas that we could have put them in. And we also said there is an interlink between the environmental risks and impact and the health and social risks uh, in terms of the local community. So it's not something that you can separate from one another. Uh, we listed the five there. We're going to go into the detail quickly on each of them. First one is in terms of contamination of agricultural soil, groundwater, and surface water with acid, salts, and metals. On the graph on the left hand side, you will see that we plotted the distribution of the DNO mines and we linked that 
to the river ecosystem status. Now you will see that the most of the mines are situated in areas where the river ecosystem has been reflected as critically endangered. So it's really got a huge impact in South Africa, and we know South Africa's water scarce region um, that depends on the rivers for food production and economic activity, and it directly have a negative impact if we have if we link where the actual DNO mines are situated uh, with the river ecosystems. Then there's also many abandoned coal mines and hard rock. Uh, mines that emit acid mine drainage, AMD, I think we are all familiar with that term. If we look at air pollution, we divided it into asbestos mines and gold mine tailing dams. Uh, firstly, in terms of the picture on the left hand side, it's a picture taken by the auditors, um, and you can see the radioactive particles blown from mine dam opposite the informal settlement. Um, during a, a, a windy day in Gauteng. In terms of asbestos mines for dams, the unmonitored asbestos polluted environments release the asbestos fibers into the atmosphere. And as soon as that reach critical levels, it can become a hazard if it is inhaled and it can prevent vegetation from growing. It could also cause asbestosis, lung cancer and mesoleomia. In terms of gold mine tailing dams, it's highly radioactive dust um, that is filled with uranium and cyanide that is transported during the windy season. Season, like I indicated, you know, the one on the left hand side is Gauteng. And in Gauteng, we know it is the province with the highest population density. Then it pollutes land, endangering the ecosystem, it causes respiratory diseases and heart and lung diseases in humans and livestock in communities living in close proximity. There's also a biological effect on the ionizing radiation on human body that includes genetic and non-genetic um, defects, um, like for instance, burn some type of leukemia, miscarriages and tumors. If we're talking about uncontrolled combustion from burning coal mine workings or dam, it's the spontaneous combustion that results in the self-heating caused mainly by low temperature oxidation of coal. And uncontrolled fires in the spore piles present problems, including the production of toxic gases, damage to the rehabilitated land, emission of greenhouse gases leading to global warming and sinkholes. The negative impact of the air quality on human health and also destroys the natural habitat of our fauna and flora. In terms of um, service deformation, I do apologize about the black block, but uh, we had to take the people out. This was also a picture that was taken by the auditors during the audit visits. You will see on the right hand side once again, there's a roof just showing you the surface deformations, how close they are to, to the informal settlements. Um, in terms of surface deformations, particular mining surface subsidence uh, that is caused by abandoned mines, then it can change the hydrological pathways. Many unsafe mine openings not rehabilitated or closed, and mine shafts an opening that is left unprotected. You can see there's no fence around it, making sure that the community knows that there is an actual hole there. Unprotected opening and unstable slopes pose serious safety risks for local inhabitants and the livestock living in close proximity. Land subsidence could disturb and damage the surface infrastructure. Illegal mining, we all know it's quite in the news at the moment. Uh, because of the type of mining operations that they use, it is very unsafe. Um, the steep excavation slopes are high risk of collapse that contribute to the health and safety concerns and it causes irreparable harm to the environment and the ecology. 
It also threatened the viability of government's holding program as the illegal miners are opening previously sealed holdings. So it is impacting on the sustainability of the closure, which is also then automatically increasing the liability on government to go back again and close those specific holdings as well. Um, once again, it's also impacting on, on the social aspects within the communities. We all know how these illegal miners are operating uh, with machine guns and everything, and it's also affecting the health of the specific citizens within the community. If we quickly have a look at the initiatives that is planned or that is already being impl implemented by the DMRE. First one, update the National DNO Mine Rehabilitation Strategy. Once the NMCS is finalized, the National DNO Mine Rehabilitation Strategy depends on the NMCS because post land use should be aligned with the legislation, policies, strategies of other government departments as defined in the NCS. And we already spoke about that earlier, that that is the first step that needs to take place. NMCS was gazetted for public comments in May 2021, and final strategy will be gazetted by March 2022. Secondly, to revise the rehabilitation project targets to align with historical budget and funding trends from National Treasury. Thirdly, immediately implement action plans to help the ROC fulfill its responsibility according to terms of reference. Fourthly, conduct liability study in 2022-23 financial year to quantify the government's liability for all abandoned mines on DNO mine database. The study will include the MRE audit and verification of information contained in the database. Also to implement performance contracts that include all key requirements of the DNO mine rehabilitation program starting in the 2022-23 financial year to develop procedures with immediate effect before end of the current financial year, which was March 2022, to direct the DNO mine rehabilitation program. Number seven, continue to expedite monitoring of DNO mine sites will be covered in procedures for monitoring and maintenance activities, which will be developed before end of current financial year, March 2022. Review and revise its contracts with implementing agents and implement revised contracts in the next financial year. Look at the migration of DNO mine database from CGS to DMRE as part of merged departments IT requirements. The database transfer will be finalized in the 23-24 financial year. Engage both CGS and MINTEC about putting in place an interim arrangement that will ensure database is kept live and regularly updated until migration has been completed. Update stakeholder engagement framework to include what action should be taken if stakeholder engagements with the communities are not successful. Propose that this item be added to the GTT agenda as a regional GTT mandate did not address the DNO mines. At this stage, I want to thank the committee and then hand back to the Honourable Chairperson for any inputs, comments or questions from your side. Thank you. Chairperson. Chai, can you hear us? Miss Boss. <laughs> yes, Mr. McCabe. Can, can I suggest that we 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 take two minutes? while you try and uh, locate the chair because uh, the presenters have been calling on him for quite some time now 
and uh, he has not been responding. It 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 uh, raises a question of whether uh, is he having a, a difficulty in terms of connection or what? Because we can see he's in the platform, but he's, he's unable to respond. Uh, so that we we have a way forward. Okay, Mr. Masalde, I'll, I'll, I'll locate him. Uh, good morning, members. I need your guidance here because I can't get hold of the chairperson. And in terms of the rules, we cannot even elect the acting chair because it's on the platform. So I don't know how to move forward now. Yeah, you can proceed, Commissar, because we've got no shading issues. Members, can I have your guidance? Uh, I am. Boss, Miss Boss? Yes, Mr. Bartholomew. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's correct that... Uh, we ought to be careful about the rules. If the chair was uh, not in the platform in terms of the uh, indication of the gadget, then the rules would allow us to elect an acting chair. But if he is on the platform, it may be tricky 
and unlawful for us to do that. Um, I do not know um, how we'll get out of this. Um, uh, and I'm not I'm not sure whether the chair is, is in KZN or is in Cape Town uh, for us to try and uh, get hold of him. Um, but uh, let's he hear other members what they say. But uh, we are constrained by the 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 rules to proceed with another chair in the presence of the chairperson, unless the the members want to uh, uh, suggest that we move on. Uh, not necessarily electing a, chair, a chairperson, but somebody who will hold the vote for the for the chair, uh, and uh, we may want to get guidance from yourselves whether that's lawful or unlawful. The point is, let's not do something unlawful, uh, but let's seek uh, progress. Let's hear other members what they say, and we'll take it from there. Thank you, Mr. Waxaule. Uh, Ms. Matoko. Um, thank you, Ms. Uh, boss. Uh, greetings to everyone. Um, I'm going to suggest that perhaps we just have someone that is going to um, assist in facilitating the program up until we're able to get hold of the chair because also time is not necessarily on our side. Uh, notwithstanding that the rules um, do not give us um, leeway to do so. But I think at the same time, we are facing a rather unusual situation. And I do not think that the rules were made or they were created uh, taking into consideration virtual platforms and issues of load shedding and all these things which we are being faced with right now. So I'm going to suggest that let's perhaps get someone to facilitate um, the meeting up until the chairperson is here. So that would then mean that we're not necessarily electing a acting chairperson. And then from your side is the support staff, then you can just work on trying to locate the chairperson. Thank you. Are there any members who want to comment or can I just ask any member to proceed so that we can get the presentations? Yes, boss. Yes, Mamali. Yeah, greetings, uh, honorable members on the platform, all our is on the call. Uh, I hear what Honorable Mataule and Madokwe are saying. Let's say we continue with facilitating the meeting and the chairperson does not come on or is unable to speak. What then? Because I think the, the table must assist us that in such a situation, what do we do? Do we suspend the sitting maybe for five minutes? You locate the chair. I don't know because his phone goes unanswered. Um, what then? Because I think he is affected by load shading because they brought out stage four of the load shading now at 10 o'clock. So I don't know which areas are affected. So maybe if we can, we can be guided from there because we don't want this work to be a future exercise. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mama Linda. I think from what the members have said, in terms of progress, this is just my opinion. It's, on, it's not on the rules because the rules doesn't allow to elect a chairperson while uh, the chairperson is on the platform because we don't know the situation and is not answering. I would suggest we proceed. We, we take one member just to lead the process so that we can have all the presentations. When we locate him, I will indicate and then he can take over. This is just my opinion. I, I, again, I'm saying members, it's not on the rules, but I'm worried because of the time and if we, we suspend this uh, sitting, what will be the implications? Thank you. Miss Boss, uh, I think we need to to take leadership. We'll explain later uh, oh. to ever will 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 ask us why we took this decision. 
Uh, I think let's move to this to the other presentation, and then we'll take questions uh, on both presentations uh, at the later stage. I am aware that the first presentation went above the time allocated, and we would want uh, the next presentation to be sensitive to that fact that uh, it went on and on because uh, the chair was not uh, 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 able to uh, facilitate the, the issue of time. But we are taking that decision that let's proceed uh, with the other presentation because it's already in the, in the agenda and we'll take responsibility uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mashaw. Mr. Mashaw will facilitate in the meantime, the chair is uh, a one. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Boss. Thank you, thank you, members. Can we then ask the next presenter to put the presenter on the... Yeah, it's uh, uh, let's have the, the human rights commission presenting and uh, it's a uh, 10:30 now uh, they will hand over back to us at 11 let's proceed like that <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, honorable members. My name is uh, J.B. Sibanyoni. I'm the commissioner at the South African Human Rights Commission. The South African Human Rights Commission will make the presentation uh, by two people, myself. I will deal with the first portion, the powers of the Human Rights Commission, and my research assistant, Advocate Mluleki Mahongo will continue dealing with the recommendations. Without any waste of time, I would like to say that this uh, briefing to the Portfolio Committee on Mineral Resources and Energy at the National Assembly, the Human Rights Commission reports on the hearing on the issues and challenges in relation to the unregulated artisanal underground and surface mining activities in South Africa. And going on the second slide, before the national hearing, the commission's intervention on the issues of the illegal mining were the following. In 2013, the Human Rights Commission hosted a round table discussion on illegal mining to discuss human rights concerning associated with uh, illegal uh, mining those human rights concerns. In 2013, also, the provincial hearing in the mining community of uh, Komahas in the Northern Cape to address and understand the artisanal mining tragedy that happened at uh, Bantuku Mine. And another one is the commission has also held several stakeholder engagements with experts and conducted uh, site visits. And honorable members, we would like to indicate that in 2015, the South African Human Rights Commission undertook an investigative hearing into the issues and challenges relating to unregulated artisanal underground and above ground mining in South Africa. One of the objectives of the hearing was to exploit avenues on how Zamazamas can be counteracted and how livelihoods taken away with retrenchments of workers be installed with artisanal mining. The panel received submissions and had oral testimonies from representatives from the Chamber of Mines, Department of Mineral Resources, Department of Health, Department of Labor, the National Coordination Strategic Management Team on Illegal Mining, amongst other stakeholders. Further, honorable members, the lack of uh, research and literature on the issue in South Africa, poor 
understanding of the profile of the Zamazamas. As not all Zamazamas began with intention to beginning involved in criminal syndicates, and not all Zamazamas are non-nationals and illegal immigrants. Legislations like the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act have failed to prevent criminal and dangerous practices. That artisanal and small-scale mining is linked to other forms of criminality like thieving of cables and tax evasion. That some artisanal mining process have uh, the potential to enable job creation and support in informal trade and other economic activities. Honorable members, we at the Human Rights Commission, we like also to indicate that the artisanal mining cannot be eradicated if social economic conditions like poverty, unemployment, inequality persist. That the current mining legislation does not, uh, the current legislation does not properly provide for artisanal mining. We'd like to further say that research that identifies the size, shape, and scope of the artisanal mining in the country build the profiles of Zamazamas, illegal gold trading syndicates, and corrupt police and security officials look at opportunities that artisanal mining can offer for marginalized people, begin to unearth the hazards and risks, including in relation to health and considering psychosocial factors connected to AM activities. Special conditions such as poverty and unemployment be monitored by way of implementation of development plans in mining areas. Further on, we'd like to say, state takes a firm stance in addressing the extent to which illegal pervades the entire mining industry, causing negative environmental and health impacts. Now, as the Human Rights Commission, we would like to also highlight the impact on human rights. Given the prevalence of illegal mining, the Human Rights Commission is concerned of its impact on human rights. The following rights are directly impacted. The right to life, right to dignity, right to safe environment, freedom and security of person, and the right to health. Further on, I will uh, then hand over to my research assistant advocate, Mlulegi uh, Mahongo. It's spelled as Marongo, but pronounced Mahongo. Over to you, advocate Mahongo, to do the proposed way forward. Uh, greetings, honorable members, and everyone else in the session. <clears throat> I think of key importance from what Commissioner Sabanyuni has just gone through is firstly that there isn't sufficient knowledge, uh, literature, research, and understanding of the industry of artisanal mining, uh, or as we colloquially would call it, uh, Zamazamas. We don't have enough information on that industry. That's the first, first thing to take away from Commissioner Sibanyuni's um, presentation. The second takeaway from Commissioner Sibanyuni's presentation is that because there's uh, not enough information, uh, studies, and research conducted on artisanal mining, there is a tendency in the media and in society to characterize uh, artisanal mining as being uh, an activity undertaken by criminals and people who are in our nation illegally. And that's not true. Uh, part of what we do know 
as the South African Human Rights Commission said, although there may be criminal elements in the teasel mining, although there may be people who are not in our nation legally who may um, also be involved in the industry, there are, however, a lot of other individuals who are in our nation legally, some of them were born here, some of them are South Africans, a lot of them are South Africans, who are attempting to find ways to escape poverty and who engage in this industry. We know that for a fact as a commission. <clears throat> the problem uh, stems from the lack of knowledge and the lack of knowledge then um, influences the media and the rest of us to mischaracterize artisanal mining. That mischaracterization then uh, in some other ways leads to an overemphasis in policing, uh, in um, punitive measures against those who are engaging in this activity. Now, of course, it is dangerous. Um, these people who go in there sometimes don't have the uh, required uh, knowledge or required or uh, equipment, but they do. So it is dangerous to go in there. However, we cannot take away the fact that a lot of these people are supporting their families. A lot of these people who are, um, they were minors themselves, who were retrenched, lost their job for one reason or another, and they're trying to support their families. And we shouldn't, in our response to this thing, take away people's ability to support themselves. <clears throat> The last part that I think we need to take away from Commissioner Sibanyuni is that we need to cure our lack of knowledge, obviously, and that curing of our knowledge means uh, these conversations need to, we need to have a, more, a far more extensive uh, conversation between the Commission, Parliament, and all the other stakeholders in this industry so that we can fully understand it. Once we fully understand it, we'll be able to then, which is the last takeaway from Commissioner Sabanyun, we'll then be able to create a regulatory frameworks that uh, weed out the criminal activity in a artisanal mining industry. We'll be able to create legislative frameworks that empower um, child, not, not child, sorry, uh, that empower uh, families to be able to use this industry to uh, feed themselves, to feed their children, to feed the extended families. We'll be able to create um, regulations that enable people to be safe while con uh, being engaged in this industry. But the first one, of course, is a careful study. So in a way forward, which of course you would have uh, picked up from my summary of uh, Commons, Commissioner Sevanyuni, is that all the stakeholders in provincial departments, in local government, in national government, chapter nines, um, civil society organizations, and most importantly, excuse me, excuse me, and most importantly, communities that are affected by this industry. Everyone needs to sit at a table and we need to come with a more credible way forward. We need to generate knowledge about this industry so that we can then go forth and create solutions. <clears throat> so this is where we speak of the engagement with DMR, uh, engage with experts, conduct further research, develop data-based uh, recommendations. That's what needs to happen. And as the commission, we are committed to um, participating in these engagements, to hosting some of these engagements, to being part of the coordinating team of these engagements, so that Parliament and uh, the Commission and all of the stakeholders are able to resolve this issue as soon as possible. Um, before I go into my last slide, the more time taken in addressing this issue, the more the criminal elements in it are going to be uh, exaggerated, are going to be the only the emphasis. Because the criminal elements, are the, uh, and I'm sorry to say this, they are the low-hanging fruit, the criminal elements. We can send the police, drag people to court, um, charge them, they're in the system, they in the criminal system, the criminal justice system. That's the lower hanging fruit here. The deeper or much more higher fruit that we need to commit ourselves to reaching for is understanding that industry so that families that are attempting to feed themselves are able to do so in a manner that is safe for them, in a manner that is safe for their communities, and in a manner that's credible and legitimate. 
um, for the greater good of society in our nation. So we propose um, in one of the ways uh, we one of the proposals we put forward is that uh, Parliament has powers in terms of Section fifty five of the Constitution, in terms of which it has to ensure that all the executive organs of state in the national sphere of government, who have a role to play. Uh, in the commission's recommendations, but not only in the commission's recommendations, but in the industry, in the artisanal mining industry as a whole, we seek or we ask parliament to use those powers to ensure that all of those organs of state play a role. They come to the table. They uh, are accountable to parliament in respect of all of the recommendations we've made. So for the, an, an easy one would be what studies have been done by the various departments that are involved in this industry? Uh, what does this? What, what is the strategy uh, that SAPS has come has uh, formulated to be able to ensure that in curbing criminal activities that we do not also criminalize uh, women who are trying to feed the children? That's what we say in the proposals to Parliament. Secondly, we say in addition to the above, the committee would like to request. Uh, updated reports from all those organs of state that have responsibility in terms of the commission's report. Now, Commissioner Sabanyuni listed uh, a whole lot of uh, state organs that participated in the hearing, uh, made submissions, and who received this report. What has happened since then? Would like Parliament to uh, try and get that information. Thirdly, we say the commission would like Parliament to consider having periodic meetings, and maybe meetings is a misnomer. Uh, we could call them something else so that uh, it's not just uh, let's talk about this, but let's try and understand this industry with a view of uh, constructing next steps in the industry. So we say we need these periodic sessions or meetings with the commission on progress in the implementation of the recommendations of the report. Lastly, we say the commission would like to ask Parliament to consider if at all, uh, if it's not already existing. Um, uh, we use the word ad hoc committee quite loosely. We're not using it uh, technically in how the Parliament has its own ad, ad hoc committee. So we use it uh, loosely. To establish, we could just say to establish a, a committee made up of various stakeholders, including the commission, which has the research, conducted some of the research. A committee that will then look at whether the recommendations of the commission in 20, this is 2022 now, whether those recommendations are still are legitimate in 2022. Uh, that committee to look at, uh, to support the various other stakeholders that have a role to play in the commission's report. That committee that's going to look at maybe um, putting together a briefing document that would probably lead then to a draft bill, uh, draft regulations to the really existing legislation. So a committee that will be made up of experts, the commission, members of parliament, members of communities that will continue to do this work if possible. If not, um, maybe parliament itself then can do that job of that committee. Mm, the last one, we, as the commission, as commissioner Samuel might have said at the beginning, we want to work with um, the state at all, at all levels, uh, including parliament. Uh, ours is to support constitutional democracy. That's what section 181 of the constitution say. We want to support uh, constitutional democracy and we cannot do that alone. And we understand that parliament can do that alone, which is why we are here to try and have this conversation and hopefully for this to continue periodically, maybe every three months we meet, we form that committee that we spoke about. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Advocate Mahongo. And uh, honorable members, I forgot to uh, alert you that my colleague, Commissioner Chris Nissen, as well as our CEO, Chantel Kissen, are also on the platform. I also forgot to Thank you for the Portfolio Committee on Minerals and Energy to give us this uh, uh, opportunity for the briefing. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Commissioner Sbanyoni and uh, Advocate Mahongo. I, I, colleagues, I've learned that the chair is back on the platform. I will duly hand over back to the chairperson. Uh, chairperson, while you were gone, uh, we had to move on with the second presentation. 
uh, we have not uh, really disturbed your flow. Uh, where you must take over is that there are two uh, presentations that have been given to the meeting. And uh, may you please take over in that regard and move forward. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Honorable Marshall. Thank you, Honorable Members. Uh, my apologies. <coughs> the, the area I was in uh, uh, really had a bad network uh, arrangement. So I had moved. The problem it doesn't remove me from the meeting, but I can't hear a thing of what is happening in the meeting. But um, at least the larger part of the first presentation, I, I did get uh, uh, from it. Can we then go uh, check the hands on the report for the um, presentation by the AGSA? Uh, I see the hand of uh, Honorable Matogwe. I'm not sure now it's gone. And uh, Honorable Malinga, uh, any other hand? The hand of Honorable Mashaule. And uh, is there any other hand? Okay, in the absence of other hands, can I? We, we usually, AGSA, give uh, them to, you take note of the questions that are being raised, then we will give you a chance to respond on all the questions. But uh, in the event there are too many, uh, from where I'm sitting, I will be able to then um, save uh, that time to allow you to, to respond. So it's better to take notes on, on, on the questions. Can I then um, uh, give Honorable Matogwe? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, greetings to Honorable Members. Uh, greetings to um, the AGSA and its representatives as the Human Rights Commission as well and its representatives. Um, I just have um, a few questions specifically on uh, I think the department will also respond and also AGSA. Um, the first one being that I think when we're speaking about illegal mining in particular, um, one of the things that are um, referred to as one of the major root causes, it is um, mines that have not been properly closed. It is mines that have not been rehabilitated. And I think all of us, we know that as a country, we're sitting with a really huge problem. Um, so when we're looking at the forecast of when these mines would be um, closed properly so or rehabilitated, um, it, it, is, it is way too far. And I'm interested in what um, strategies are there um, to make sure that the issue of closing mines and rehabilitation is done much quicker. Uh, understanding as well that there's an issue of budget, but what other options could that could be undertaken. I've also realized as well that there's also a focus mostly on asbestos mines. So I'm interested in other mines as well in terms of what is happening there and what are the states in terms of the mines that need to be closed and rehabilitated outside the scope of asbestos mines. Um, one thing that I found extremely alarming um, and which also gives an impression that we're actually tackling a huge problem um, without the necessary information and without the necessary strategies, which therefore means that um, we are to a certain extent, or the department and the relevant uh, stakeholders are to a certain extent um, going to possibly work on, 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 on projects that are failing because there's not um, a proper strategy. Because I think what the presentation also speaks about is that there is no um, national mine closure strategy, um, which should have been compiled and completed almost 11 years ago. So I'm interested in why that has not been done yet and what um, informs the current um, approach to dealing with mining uh, rehabilitation if there is no 
National Mining Strategy. Um, the presentation also spoke about the fact that the mining database is also not as accurate, which therefore means that one, if they were looking at the report, they'd be sitting at a place where it means that we're not even sure um, the scope of the work that needs to be done because that database has not been completed or it is not accurate. So what plans are there? And why number one is the database not complete? Um, and what plans are there to actually make sure that because for you to undertake a problem, you need to know the scope of such a problem. You need to know how many mines are we actually dealing with? Where are they? What is the issues? And if we don't have that, it therefore means that even the projections that we have currently might be highly inaccurate. And I think that also the issue of um, the DMRE three and five year plans not having uh, something that speaks to mine closures is something that also perhaps we must get from the department why that is the case. Um, I think those are the four issues that I have, Chairperson. Thank you. Okay, Honorable Malin. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, welcome back. Uh, I have already greeted everybody on the platform. I'll zoom straight to my questions. Chair, let me welcome the presentation by AGSA. Um, I'm not sure on my presentation, I don't see the slide numbers, but uh, the slide on key contributors. Uh, there is a bullet point that says ROC did not fulfill its responsibility. Um, Chairperson, I just want to check how can the failure of the ROC on fulfilling its mandate be remedied if it's, it's possible, Chair, and how soon can that be done? Also, Chair, on, this, on the second slide, which uh, bears leadership and oversight key deficiencies, um, I think this is, it goes to uh, DMRE uh, because uh, I think it's the first point that it, it outdated national strategy. It means the MRE has not uh, updated its, man, its, its, its strategy, its national strategy. How soon can they update the national strategy, Chair? Also, Chairperson, why were the plans not costed and aligned to, t to key outcomes? If maybe we can get clarity on that one, Chairperson. Also, Chairperson, uh, the mine closure strategy, how soon, do does, how soon does DMRE anticipate to have that strategy up and running or completed uh, for implementation? Uh, let me submarine there for now, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and uh, greetings to everybody. Uh, Chair. <clears throat> Let me start by welcoming the presentation made by the Auditor General South Africa and uh, say that uh, together with the department, or maybe not together, but the department should be called to really um, we, we zoom into the findings of the Auditor General and um, probably look at possible posi uh, 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 proposals that we can make so that uh, uh, we better the situation. Some of the things that uh, were presented are, are really not uh, uh, above their, their, their heads, uh, meaning it's out of their control. Uh, but together, we probably can come with better ways to deal with some of the issues that the report uh, raised. On the uh, Human Rights Commission, um, I, I want to welcome the uh, proposals. Uh, and I do think that the committee uh, on one of the proposals where it... Um, proposes an ad hoc committee that will deal with the situation. The committee need to look at that because the, the issue is escalating into 
very uh, uh, dire situation and it needs a very special focus uh, as well as the recommendations of periodic meetings with the committee uh, and updates from all those that the report uh, has fingered uh, that they, they, they are responsible state organs to deal with the issue. We, we need to look at those recommendations and see if we can't action them. One thing that I, I, I want to inquire from the Human Rights Commission is related to uh, situations that are like the one that happened in Jagafonte, where in my view, and, and it remains my view, that uh, the law may have erred. And when I say the, uh, the law, I mean the courts may have erred uh, in their judgment to say uh, uh, the, the mind dump that uh, uh, collapsed and uh, took the lives of uh, people, devastated their households and so forth, was not a a matter that can be regulated anymore in the MPRDA because they did not consider what was happening there, a mining activity. Now, <clears throat> at what point does the Human Rights Commission decide to enter the issue and protect uh, the, the, the human beings and their rights to exist in a very um, conducive environmental uh, area. And in this instance, their rights were violated uh, uh, because when the judgment says the, 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 the Department of Mineral Resources uh, cannot regulate uh, through mine health and safety inspectorates, it made a judgment that this inspectorates must be conducted by the Department of Labor. And in my view, there's no one in the Department of Labor that understands what happens in a mine dump and their environmental uh, uh, situations, and therefore may not be competent to, to do those um, uh, inspections. At what point does uh, human rights uh, become intimate with the human dignity uh, of um, uh, our people and say this is a matter that we want to take up with either the law or the courts or whoever they are um, uh, empowered to take uh, the matter to. I have seen uh, the human rights taking interest in protecting human beings uh, where their rights are violated. Can't they look at this issue and see if the rights of our people are not violated? And in my view, once there's death, there's devastation of uh, uh, households and so forth, there, 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 there is somebody who would have violated uh, uh, the dignity of our people. Uh, and I, 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 I'm just interested if the Human Rights Commission is not interested in uh, entering this point and check if there has been a possible uh, violation of the rights of our people and how they can protect them. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, Honorable Marshall. Uh, yes, before, yes, before, before you... I... Yes, Honorable Malin. I'm not sure. Are we still going to have an, a, another chance to ask questions to SA, to HSRC? Wait for, wait for me. Wait for me to finish what I was saying. I'll help you. Can we before we go? Let's. Um, can I request that the Human Rights Question, the Human Rights uh, Commission, not now. The first issue we were dealing was still dealing with the HSA. But they already have a question that is coming from Honorable Mashaule. It means when we go to them, they will also would have prepared an answer to that question. 
for now, uh, we are with dealing with the AGSA report. I'm not sure AGSA, I do have a suggestion of how I think we can handle this matter. But in both reports, <clears throat> my major concern is whether we move, we will be moving from the, fair, the same factual basis in terms of understanding uh, of the of the issues raised. So maybe so that I don't consume too much time uh, and we end up not uh, finalizing finishing the matter that we're dealing with. I'm just looking at the time. Let me first give you the platform to respond on the questions that were, 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 were raised by honorable members. The Thank platform you, is yours. Thank you, Chair. Much appreciated. Uh, to the members, thank you for those questions. It's much appreciated. I think the questions are clear and they resonate. And uh, when we look at these questions, um, both from the honorable members, where uh, honorable Madokwe talks about a database not complete, um, and also the strategy needs to be in place, you know. So why is the strategy not in place, etc.? Chair, these questions need to be posed to the department, and I think they're valid questions that the department needs to respond to. If you look at Krishna's presentation at the end, where we look at the commitments from the department. These are commitments that the department had already made. And if you look at the timelines, some of these should have been in place by now, as they had given a commitment to March 2022. So I think it's something that needs to be monitored and something that needs to be posed to the department when you'll call them in to address your questions. I think key to that, and it also flows into the second one of Honorable Melinda's questions, I think both why the ROC did not fulfill its responsibilities. Um, again, it's something that the department needs to answer to. But again, it's a commitment that the department has given and it's captured in their commitments at the close of the audit. Chair, I'm going to stop there also. I'm not going to go further on it. I'll be guided by you. But I think we welcome those questions. But I think those questions then have the base of the commitments that the department has given as captured in the presentation, but it's also captured in the detailed report. And I think it's something that then the, the, the committee can then request the department in preparation to give an update to you all on those commitments that they have committed to. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh... AGSA. Look, the, let, let me just highlight a few areas which I think um, they, they require. Um, first, uh, I would have loved that, um, and I hope uh, it, it may relate also to uh, South African Human Rights Commission. <clears throat> One thing that the Portfolio Committee of Parliament must not do because at times we, we may find that um, we fall in a trap of seeking to justify or defend the actions instead of asking for more uh, information or help, by the way. <clears throat> I would have loved HSA for starters in the analysis of the mandate of committees of parliament as a general matter that um, from an AGSA point of view, and I think I once raised this thing when there was a rating of performance of portfolio committees, to say, have we been able to look at the issue of, because the mandate can be there, but the capacity may not be there. Let me make an example about this portfolio committee to be specific. But the biggest problem is that from where now personally I'm sitting is that Parliament from its inception, and I think it's a discussion, the two entities must also assist us, that Parliament has adopted a more top-heavy system where there is too much invested in the executive and very little 
uh, invested on the oversight institutions, in this case, the legislature. For instance, a practical example is that we are sitting with a portfolio committee that has got one researcher responsible for a department that will be having, I don't know how many, including the fact that a portfolio committee of parliament can hire consultants. But departments will have all the required um, services, if one were to use the correct word, and still, by law, be allowed to apply for consultants. Now, with one researcher who is doing research on every aspect, in this case on mineral resources, will be expected to do so. And a complementary staff that is almost, I, I can't even measure how much it is. Now, the reason I'm saying is the complementary work, which I think one should appreciate, is what is not coming out clearly, that for these institutions, like the portfolio committees of parliament, they will continue to need close interactions with what I would call the chapter nine institutions, not just based on, on, on what they should do, but also on, on how they should do that level of oversight accountability. Let me make an example. I don't think something still stops the AGSA, nor even the human rights, I should have said when we come, they may have a take, stops them to say, when we said your, the strategy has not happened and you have not done so, from an AGSA point of view, you should tell us why this has not happened. And it then comes to the committee as to say, in as much as we would have made them aware, they have not done this, and therefore that committee has got a basis to deal with the matter. This then gets followed by another aspect. Now, I just want to put them broadly HSD. Part of the other issue that I think it might be necessary, even if on the way moving, moving forward, is, is the fact that some of the, 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 the submissions made who have said, for instance, an entity can give the best financial accounting, but in terms of performance audit, it becomes very difficult to understand whether the fact that you get good financial results or audit outcome does not necessarily mean that uh, it is equivalent to good service delivery audits. And whether AGSA is prepared to now look beyond the issue of performance, financial performance, but also look at service, service delivery performance as another effective tool. Thirdly, is that the issue of the financial performances are just an, out, an output or an outcome. But when you look at what you would say, the deposits or your, 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 your inputs, for an example, when the budget is put in there, let's make again for with mineral resources and energy. Part of the concern that was raised, leave the fact that, by the way, I don't think the two entities are operating concurrently. The initial responsibility was given to, as far as I know, was given to the Council for Geoscience, CGS, then moved to MinTech. So it's no longer like two entities working concurrently on the issue. Here is a, a dilemma, is that when you look, and I think you are raising the issue of lack of sufficient uh, funding or insufficient funding as a problem, Literally and factually is that you are sitting with almost 6,000, not even the 2.7, 6,000 derelict and ownerless mines. In that, there is only a hundred and, if I'm not mistaken, 124 million allocated per financial year to deal with that thing. Clearly, like uh, I think Honorable Marshall was also raising, is that in terms of the input, um, uh, 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 cost to the exercise. 
it, it, it would go without saying that it cannot address the challenge that we're faced with now. Hence, your annual performance target, even your five, there are five-year strategic plans, your annual performance must always be guided by what is available to do that, to perform that task. Is there no other way which the AGSA can then say, this is how this can help? For instance, we have asked the department, what is the total cost that we need? And the assumption goes even beyond um, uh, 14 billion rents. There is, at times, you get a value of 40 billion in order to do the total issue. So I will reserve some of the issues. So I'm saying, maybe for me, those are some of the issues that in the, in the I don't want to call it a partnership, but moving forward, to what extent we can be able to make a consideration of, 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 uh, of, of, of collaboration between the two. Uh, I don't know whether then the HSA would want to have a take uh, and, and before we go for consideration of, this, of those matters. No, thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Much appreciated. Chair, uh, just on some of those, those issues, um, when we look at AGSA as part of the Chapter 9 uh, portfolio, our focus is moving largely towards looking at service delivery and the impact on the lives of citizens. So whether it is through the performance audits or even if it is within our financial audits or, or even within our real-time audits, our team is now looking at at that impact on citizens, looking at also some of the audits that historically would have received uh, clean financial results and looking at uh, what's the impact of service delivery in these entities and how effective is the service delivery. So, so your comments are well taken and it is something that will be built in the AGSA strategy. Um, looking at obviously partnerships, we we work very closely with the department in trying to highlight those areas that uh, have to a large extent been tripping the processes that they have been conducting so as to give them the opportunity uh, within their leadership to come up with um, commitments that they obviously then are bound to and that they feel that is feasible and doable within their resources and, and within the capacities um, and, and to do their necessary costing within the, within the necessary ambits of what their priorities. As we have mentioned, they have, they have a national strategy that needed to be implemented some 11 years ago. And, uh, and that work that they've now committed to has to be a strategy that, that um, they can close off on, taking into consideration their strategic priorities and the discussions with the, with the relevant role players within the, the sphere of the rehabilitation and also the priorities of DMRE as a whole. And also they have to do this in conjunction with the treasury, et cetera, because there's funding that needs to be established to perform these tasks and to and to and to commit to the funds to to this rehabilitation process. So uh, we had long discussions with the entity and the executive, and arising from that, where these commitments that they have. Uh, given which has been uh, which has been shared with you towards the end of the presentation, and these commitments, obviously, we will continue to follow up on also in follow up audits audits of this nature. But it will also be followed up in the yearly uh, the yearly financial audit or mandatory audit that we do. <clears throat> uh, these have also been discussed with the audit committees, et cetera, so that it also forms part of that monitoring system. Thank you, Chair. 
Okay, thank you, thank you. Can I, I request so that uh, probably at the end we, we, we will say what uh, is suggested as the way forward uh, with regards to this. But uh, thank you very much you know, with the presentation. Uh, from where I'm sitting, I think uh, I'll be speaking for most of for the honorable members. It's, it's, it's opening up eyes. It gives us pointers. Um, I ex, ex, uh, safe to say uh, both with um, the entities. It also talks to the current issues that the committee sees with with other sister committees of parliament. But uh, if you were to to leave, please, um, someone in the same capacity or similar or closer capacity can uh, remain behind so that when we do a wrap up, at least there can be a, that person will have uh, a, a way a, a way forward understanding, although we still have to do officially the way forward. Can I go to any questions to the SA? Um, HRC. Any is the the hand a uh, look as a hand honourable Masaule? Chair, I I have asked my question. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Then I will have honourable Malinga, honourable Mato. But is there any other hand for the South African Human Rights Commission? Uh, in the absence of that, you already have a question uh, from Honorable Mashaule, uh, AJ, uh, um, said AJSA, HRC. Uh, can I then uh, go to Honorable Malinga? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Greetings again to everybody on the platform. Chairperson, I just want to zoom straight to what Advocate Mahongo said. Actually, I find it very, very disturbing that he will liken illegal mining to artisanal mining. Illegal mining is when people, they mine without being given the right or permission or a license by a state or a, a mining company. That's when we talk about illegal mining, where we find people getting uh, injured or communities being subjected to dire circumstances in a form of environment or also being abused by the illegal miners. Whereas artisanal mining, Chair, it's either it's artisanal mining or it's a small scale mining, which is doing an, an informal activity using low technology or minimal machinery. That means that one is legalized. So I, 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 I find it odd that he, he will liken the two that are not so similar uh, because the illegal miners, we are in this um, portfolio committee today asking the AGSL, AGSA to give us their uh, outcome on the derelict and ownerless mines. Because illegal mining happens in the derelict and ownerless mines, or in the mines as we have seen from our visit this weekend, where the, 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 the mining companies are not taking, um, uh, they, are, they, have, they, they have a license, but they are not using it and it's closed and people, they went there without um, um, being uh, uh, warranted to go there or having a right. So I, I, I am confused, Chair, that it, 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 Human Rights Commission advocate will say it is okay for people to mine illegally because they have to put food on the table for the families. We know unemployment is ripe in South Africa. Hence, as this portfolio committee, we are pushing very hard that let mining companies and DMRE upscale artisanal 
mining. That will assist people it's either who are late or retrenched by mining companies or people who are unemployed due to mining companies scaling back on their employees. If maybe I can be clarified on that one, Chairperson, because it's like we are promoting people to do illegal things in a legal environment, but illegally. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you very much, Chair. I think uh, most of the questions that I had noted, um, I think even with the previous one, would have to be directed to the department, not necessarily human rights. But I do have like maybe three questions that I'd like to. No, let me let me let me let yeah. me clarify. On, sorry, sorry, Honorable Matter. Let me clarify, Honorable. Mm -hmm. the, the issue is that we are a committee of parliament. We are given information by concerned entities, in this case, fortunately, entities of the state call them chapter nine institution. They then say, we are giving you this information for your execution of the task. So invited them. It is up to this committee then to say, given this information that we receive, we want the department to give us answers. Now the department, you can then invite the we can invite the Human Rights Commission and invite the AJSA and then say to the department they must respond because they should have responded at the time also this information was put at their disposal. It is the duty of this committee, therefore, to say, why didn't you act on this and that? And if then there is a dispute of the facts given to us in this committee by the department we will then deal with the issue at that moment. So let's see this session as a session that seeks to empower us as members of the portfolio committee to do our work of oversight accountability going forward. So we will most definitely, the department still has to answer on the issues raised. Just feel free and relax on that one. Okay, you can continue around the matter. No, that's fine, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for the direction. So as I was saying, I have three questions directed to the Human Rights Commission. Um, the first one, I think it's a question of um, terminology, and I think that perhaps I'd want to understand from their side, because I understand that the report that they would given us, it is on unregulated artisanal mining. So I'm trying to understand, according to their understanding, what is the fundamental difference between unregulated artisanal mining and illegal mining and whether during the the, the the hearings that they had with the different stakeholders they were able to perhaps make the link between um, what we now have of um, illegal mining and um, our people not being able to actually get mining licenses on time or not even being able to know what is the procedure um, around um, applying for, for mining licenses? Because I don't think that in the report, um, the report spoke about that because my understanding is that if there was not necessarily a backlog of mining licenses and people actually knew how to actually apply for these mining licenses, then we'd have fewer people actually undertaking these illegal um, or rather unregulated mining um, activities. Um, the second one, I think there's a recommendation by the Human Rights Commission that there must be some sort of a committee that is comprised of various stakeholders, including themselves, um, to discuss and perhaps pave a way forward in terms of what needs to be done in relation to illegal mining. But I'm also interested because I know that some of the stakeholders that they had engaged with, we have what we have is the National Coordination Strategic management team on illegal mining. So I'm interested um, in who that is composed of. Um, where are they in the conversation on illegal mining and who, who do they really account to? Because I think that if there's already a national coordinating team um, that had been established, um, they would have to actually be part of the conversation on illegal mining. And wouldn't then that ad hoc committee sort of like be replicating what is being done by this uh, coordinating team. And then I think the third question is that um, when we had raised the questions with the department in terms of how far they were with implementing 
uh, the recommendations that had been done by this report in particular, they had indicated that they had responded and written to the Human Rights Commission. But the presentation we're getting here or the impression that we are getting, it's as if they are still, the, the Human Rights Commission is still waiting for various departments to, to get back to them in terms of how far they are with implementing. So I'm trying to understand since the report was um, published or made available, I think it was 2014 from then up until now, what have been the engagements between the Human Rights Commission and the various departments, not necessarily just the DMRE, and what were the challenges that were there in terms of making progress? Because some of the things that are noted in this report, it's things that could have been done um, a long time ago, and they still have not been done. So we're trying to understand that since the report was established or the report was processed, what have been the engagements, especially considering the fact that the department itself said, no, we have also responded to the Human Rights Commission. The Human Rights Commission is saying, no, we're still waiting for the departments to get back to us. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Madoba. Uh, let me also welcome the, this report. I think I must do it now. Uh, uh, we we just I, I just need a um, few clarities, uh, Human Rights Commission. The the first one for me, it starts from the opening. I think let's agree. I, I I like to deal with practical examples. Whether do we share the, the we will share the same understanding of the definition of access non mining. Uh, to the best of uh, from where I'm sitting. Artisanal mining is regulated in terms of the act. It only needs policy and regulations that the department has to develop. What has been a concern from many out fronts was that the current policy on artisanal mining that the department has, has developed does not talk to underground mining. And, and I'm saying this thing of artisanal or small scale mining from an experience of some of the successful launches that took place, which were attended, uh, presided over by the then Deputy Minister of Mineral Resources, then in the Northern Cape, if I'm not mistaken, in Kuruma. Now, there is a really a serious issue where we were on Saturday there was the same confusion where people said, you are calling us illegal, you are calling us as artisanal mining, uh, illegal mining. It, 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 it can't be. Somebody try and show to us a practical example where artisanal mining, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a polemic issue, it's a, well, it's a language issue. To the best of my knowledge though, Legally, there is a difference between artisanal mining and um, uh, 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 illegal mining activities. Again, in illegal mining activities, not every, and I can say this, not every illegal mining activities is violent and criminal, criminal like what you would call it common common law criminal activity or common, yes, crim common and criminal activities. Where we were, for instance, this coming week, this last, this last weekend on Saturday in Pegas for Stairport, it will be difficult to then say that is literally what you we'll call hardcore criminal. The issues the communities were raising there was that there were two. I want us to be practical. There were two. They say the problem is that the, the three monopoly uh, multinationals occupy a huge space for us to do mining. And we, we can't, and therefore 
we have to find means of surviving. That's locals. When you, they say the second part is that our work is being made more difficult by the licensing regime, specifically by DMRE, not doing what they are supposed to do to fast track the process of licensing for locals to undertake. Now, I want us to show that when we have this discussion, it should not be a finger pointing or whatever, defense and so forth. As I said, my main worry is that it says your, in your presentation, there's somewhere where it says lack of research, yes, lack of research and literature on the issue in South Africa. I've been trying to go through and say, if I were to decide the panel discussion and any other means, that to me is submissions of individuals that are making. Scientifically, and as a practical example, where do we get this beyond the panel or what you would call a desktop information? I'm raising this thing with all due respect uh, in terms of the Human Rights Commission. The first problem is that I can't find where this thing, where it is problematized. The first problem with illegal mining activities, when it comes to derelict and ownerless mines, is the fact that the legislation predating 2002-2004 never gave responsibility of rehabilitation of mines. Maybe from a human rights point of view, you can help. Now you are sitting with derelict and ownerless mines that were left, and therefore that were left by those mining companies without any liability for rehabilitation. And we are sitting with this thing now um, as a legacy problem. You can't hold them accountable, you can't hold them liable, you can't hold them responsible because the law does not apply retrospectively. Maybe you can then help us and say, in conditions and situations of this nature, from a human rights point of view, this is the angle then you must look at with regards to liability and, and, and responsibility. But linked to this, I'm not sure whether we share the same thing. We went to a place, uh, I just forget this place we were on Sunday. In fact, if you were to go, to, we were to go all of us to Krugerstor, and uh, we must invite the Human Rights Commission also to join us when we go to the Free State on Saturday. And we go to Gauteng. In the Free State, I get paid as an example. There was a time in a specifically Harmony Gold Mine where the issue of Zamazamas, now, because Zamazamas are not the same, where the issue of Zamazamas was, was very high. On a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every day, they were taking people who were put up to the surface because of a particular arrangement made where who died underground or killed by others. All of them had addresses. We're not talking about something that is, and, and I agree to say, it is not every Zamazama who is a foreign national. But the point is, at a practical and experience level, every person who was coming underground would have an address that that person must be sent to Lesotho. But you can, if, now, if you go back to the government of Lesotho when they spoke, they never denied what they were said. They said the problem with South Africa is that they are keeping people that we want for particular reasons from where they come from. Now, if you go to Rodeport now and say to Rodeport, no, 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 those people are, are not non-South Africans and even non-documented, the first thing that even police will tell you is that almost 100% of what they have, people were arrested on that tragic day where eight women were raped some multiple times, that almost all those people are undocumented. There's nothing wrong being a foreign national. I think we need to take that thing away. So, so I want also that when we compare these things, we also don't throw back to the communities and say, you are wrong, you have got stereotypes. When we went to the Israel, we were told that, we, for instance, when we went there, some of them said, who are from Mozambique, who are being dominated by the Zimbabweans because they don't want, that's how themselves record, regard it. 
They don't want to go underground. They wait for us to bring the material on surface, and then they will take the, they take from us. And they say we are also being chased away by the ones of the Lesotho, because yes, they can go underground, but they want what you call the rich areas where these commodities will come from. It will be wrong, though, to categorize in that fashion. But the reality, what you have in our community is exactly that, because they say we live and stay, we, we are telling you what you are experiencing. Now, to dispute that, it will then have to say, I have been to this place, and this is what people have said. Uh, now, I'm giving, for me, a personal account of what is coming from. Now, I don't want us, I don't want to, to, to dispute something that is that is not there. But the point therefore that I have is that in terms of the labor law or labor relations, the issue of retrenchments, there has been no case. Let's, let's deal with case studies. There's been no case study that has shown that in the retrenchments that have taken place, in terms of the uh, things that are called layout, I'm not sure. That, that that take place, that these people would have been working in this mine, and this is what they've got. Now, now I'm saying maybe at some point we must sit down and have a scientific discussion that is based on, on, on direct experience, not, 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 not a dispute of fact. Now, the last thing I thought I needed to, to, to raise. There is no doubt in South Africa, everything that we have, and that is why sometimes even the police, they'll raise this thing that as long as you still have got social challenges, social challenges like unemployment, issues of inequality, poverty, crime is going to be one of the serious challenges that we'll be confronted with. But where then we have to talk to is one, yes, what we have noticed, and I think we must say that, and all will agree, you can arrest millions of your Zama Zamas and uh, with whatever you, you do when they do the trade. The point is, and I would have thought maybe the human rights and probably um, AGSA to help, that one of the things that we have said, for instance, to the department is that as long as you don't have, um, when you are catch with a diamond, you will have to account, and it is a criminal offense, you go to jail. The point is that when you go to these areas, one, you can see there is a market, the batteries that they have, some of them they buy food, so there is market. But the rest is that the cars that come at times, which some of us have seen and ran away, the cars that go there, they tell you that you are just dealing with the small low hanging fruits when you deal with the people who are taking or doing all these things. There is a market. And the question is, how do you deal with that market? I would have thought maybe also you can, that, 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 that assistance will be provided to say, one of the things, for instance, we said is that make gold as a, as a commodity, make gold a strategic, not just a strategic mineral, but a scarce mineral at risk, and therefore, no individual, in the same way we dealt with the Kimberley process. Two, is that you need legislation. But beyond the legislation that does that, you need, and that's what the department, we thought they said they were conversing. We need a, a global approval of gold as that specialized, identified, scarce. Uh, commodity and therefore be treated as such, be it at the United Nations level, be it, be it at, the, at other uh, trade uh, uh, platforms. Otherwise, as long as you still have this as not the case, we still continue to have the problem. So we say there are levels up to what we we'll call tertiary, uh, tertiary level, which is where money is being made, rather than those. When you ask some of them, They'll be telling you that we sell a bag for 400 or 700 rands. That tells you that somebody is making a big, a big um, returns out of this actually Amazon. The next thing that you have also, which is what they were saying, is that, and what we don't have proof, and we think it will help uh, institutions like this one, is that there is a potential and a 
big possibility that your normal and formalized, especially gold mining sector, could be also part of this problem in order to avoid paying money. One example, if you go to the area where we were, and we are not saying it's true, it's a possibility, is that somebody gets, gets mining rights on the, on the on underground, the other one gets, now we are told others are buying mining rights on what you can call surface, which is the mine terms. The potential is that your illegal mining activities, specifically on gold, could be subsidizing legal mining indirectly. They take that, they make it as if it's a commodity, and it goes out in a smart way. We, we, I think for me, it, it's one of the things we have to look to, to look to look at them and, and, and address this thing. Lastly, please help us. Like I made this example, so that we, we don't we are not being seen not to be sensitive and serious about what is happening in South Africa. In Krukastorp, and I hope the Human Rights Commission could go there and bring a, and, and, and bring what they say is a, is a real information. In Krukastorp, they say we, we can't. In fact, even where we were on Sunday, they say in, on Sunday, they said, two o'clock, we can't move around. Two, they say women have reached a stage that they are now no longer prepared to speak when it comes to rape because rape is a daily, it's more like a daily experience and a daily activity. Now, I'm saying we may have to balance whether what South Africans are reporting out of their experience is a far-fetched thing, it is not what they are saying, and vis-a-vis -vis whether really there is something that needs to be addressed, and amongst other issues, whether the problem, especially of crime, especially of Zamasamas, whether it is a problem that South Africa can solve on its own, or it is something that SADC on its own must address, including the nature of political leadership that is required in many of our neighboring states, which then may, may be making people to track south. I just wanted to flag those things because they could be, we might be losing a broader discussion on finding a solution. And when we find that solution, we then address this thing. If, 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 if uh, when you give a response, we can deal with those broad issues and then what then could go forward. There is no doubt, obviously, police have been arrested. There is no doubt about it. By the way, what we learned um, on Sunday was that even some politicians, they may not be South African, we were shown someone whom we were told would be the guys that they were showing confidential that here is a person at some point in his country, he was a provincial police commissioner. And at this time, he has become a, 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 a minister of police. And they were distributing 200 grand notes. That's what they showed us, distributing 200 grand notes. It's a country that is outside South Africa, but what they are distributing is the South African currency. So, so it may not even include police, it may not include, it may even include some of this, and I'm not saying some people in senior strategic position, including in the formal trading of the, of the commodity. But I wonder, I wonder, I wonder that you took for yourselves to, to make a take on this one, because like I said, amongst other things that I fear was is when we say, our people, when they are reporting on these things, and we have not found something contrary to what they say, we say probably they are making a wrong, wrong, providing wrong information. Let me give you uh, uh, SAHRC. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, let me take the first question, and I would like to uh, alert honorable members that. Uh, my area has got a uh, low shedding from 12 o'clock until uh, 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 half past, until until two o'clock. But uh, nevertheless, uh, my research advisor, Advocate Morongo, will continue while I'm trying to relocate to an area where there is uh, no load shedding. And also my colleague, Commissioner Chris Nissen, may 
want to say something has been on a provincial visit to the northern province. Also, the uh, acting CEO may add on. But without any uh, waste of time, I will deal with the question uh, that was asked uh, uh, by Honorable uh, Madokwe uh, concerning the judgment that was delivered by the court. As the Chapter 9 uh, institution, we've got no mandate to deal with a matter that is before court or where there has been a decision of the court. But uh, uh, we've got uh, a mandate. The Constitution talks about our functions as a Human Rights Commission. Uh, 184 says that the the South African Human Rights Commission must, it's, a, it's imperative, must monitor and assess the observance of uh, human rights in the Republic. Therefore, uh, despite that uh, uh, judgment, as the Human Rights Commission, we have the powers and functions uh, to monitor uh, on the ground whether human rights are not uh, violated. We are able to make an intervention and uh, secondly, uh, we have to uh, establish what triggered uh, the, uh, the, the root cause, and then that it should not be repeated. And then uh, uh, I just want also uh, to uh, uh, appreciate uh, the comment by uh, Honorable Matongwe to say uh, this. Uh, uh, minds that are not uh, properly closed or rehabilitated, they 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 have a a whole host of uh, uh, issues and challenges that they 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 they, they, they cause. And then uh, I also want to indicate that uh, uh, any any individual has got a. A, a right to can approach the South African Human Rights Commission where uh, human rights have been violated. But as I have said also uh, that my research advisor will deal with those uh, questions, especially the one that was directly uh, uh, asked to, to him by Honorable Malinga and uh, uh, also, my uh, our CEO and my colleague may, may like to add something. I just want to uh, try and move towards a place where there is no low shedding. At the moment, my, my system always keeps on beeping to say, your internet connection is unstable. Uh, Advocate uh, Mahongo, would you deal with the questions that were directed to you while I'm trying to, to relocate to another place? So I think a lot of uh, this issues are literally the type of issues, some of them, if not a lot of them, are the type of issues that were envisioned uh, that the committee we've suggested in our way forward um, would be able to dig deep into. But just for clarity's sake, uh, let me just share this so that everyone, I'm not sure if the report was, the actual report of the commission was shared with the committee. We can share that, um, but also you know what the report was about and what, was, what it was not about. Um, our report was, was a South African Human Rights Commission report on hearing on issues and challenges in relation to unregulated artisanal underground and surface mining activities in South Africa. Now, I want to go to the actual report. Um, and I hope it has been shared, but if it hasn't been shared, I can email it uh, to our parliamentary liaison officer, Fadla, who will then send it to the relevant committee. But an, a, an important aspect that clarifies some of the thinking and submissions we've made is found on page 26 of the report, if the report is available to members. And if I could just read the highlighted paragraph there, we say that, oh, the, the report says the following. 
Legislation setting out guidelines for regulating the mining industry, the Mineral and Resources Petroleum Act, focuses mainly on large-scale mining, with a few exceptions. Section 23 of the MPRDA Amendment Act describes a permitting process for allowing small-scale mining on an area not exceeding five hectares, which can be mined optimally within a period of two years. Unlike the mining rights requirement for large-scale mining, obtaining a mining permit does not require an economic uh, or social and labor plan. Yet, this process can still be quite onerous as it requires submitting technical applications and environmental management plans and applications for, environment, for environmental authorizations, which may not be clear or doable for small scale miners and certainly out of reach for artisanal miners. I, I want to reference the discussion document. Um, on artisanal mining, I'm, I'm hope I can share. I hope members can see it's um, the discussion document. I've got it flighted here on artisanal mining, it, which confirms the challenges we found as the commission, uh, which I've just read now. On page four of this documentation, it says here section twenty-seven of the MPRTA, which deals with the licensing regime for for ASM industry, uh, has been largely seen or has been seen largely as prohibitive to the development and growth of the sector. This is mainly because the act does not define concepts. It does not cater for the artisanal mining industry. Small scale miners are virtually treated as the same as large scale miners in terms of requirements for environmental management, water use, land use, health and safety and financial provisioning. I think the main point was that what we had found is that a lot of the people that made submissions uh, to the commission were and, uh, people who are unable um, to satisfy the requirements in, uh, sorry, our CEO is saying, don't know what's going on. Well, our CEO says she can't, she, for some reason, can't join. It says the connection for this site is not secure. She just sent me something on, on email. I'm not sure if someone can address that. But what I was saying is, what we found is that a lot of the people that are, are involved um, in artisanal mining are people who are unable to access uh, the legislative requirements or to satisfy the legislative requirement for their recognition. And those are the people we were speaking to or we were, we were, uh, our presentation and our report speaks to. And as a result of these people who are unable to access um, or satisfy or fulfill some of these legislative requirements, in the report, which I hope it has been uh, submitted, many of these individuals are criminalized. Many of these individuals are subjected to um, police raids, um, prosecution. Um, there's a whole lot of things said about them in communities and in the media regarding what, uh, or assumptions that what they're doing is illegal or that these people are not supposed to be even in the nation. These are the people that we are speaking to in our report. But I think a large bulk of it, unless there's anything not clear, a large bulk of what uh, I was listening to um, requires this level of detail in terms of the scientific um, knowledge that we have said is lacking within this industry. Those who are regulated, those who are unregulated, those who should be regulated, those who are not regulated. It, it's not something we can uh, easily go through as the commission. And uh, with your, sorry, someone else now. Stop sharing. Apologies, Chef. Just there's someone else from our team who is. I'm just gonna. Uh, uh... <laughs> yeah, man. You disappeared, Mr. Mahong. Uh, sorry, Chair. I'm just uh, with my other colleague who's unable to log in. I'm going to be here now, just now. I'll ask her to help. What do they require, Chair? What are you saying, Ari? 
Now, what do they require, Che? Now, they say someone wants to connect, you can chat with them or on, on the site. But can you continue, Mr. Varon? So Richard, there's no one in the waiting room. We will see him or her when she, she must come and then we'll accept. We must just yeah. go to the link we sent. They requested that we remove this, the acting CEO, which we did. I didn't want to follow the other thing that I had. Uh, sorry, colleagues, that was our... That was our CEO, uh, Chantel. She had been she had logged in and was part of the, pre the the presentation, but for some reason during the question the questions she was logged out. Uh, she sent me a screensaver that says, which tries to log in says the connection for this site is not secure. So she was calling me now to just uh, at just one point about what has happened after the report was um, released. The report was sent to each one of the stakeholders that have been that had submitted uh, submissions, but also each department uh, that has a role to play in respect of the issues pertaining to the report. Mm -hmm. Subsequently to that, she says there was an interministerial interministerial committee, uh, part of which uh, the DMRE was part of that committee, where the commission sought to find out what steps had been taken uh, in the realization of fulfilling of some of the recommendations of the commission. But since then, it hasn't met since uh, the lockdowns um, came in, and we haven't come back to have a meeting with that intermissile commit uh, committee. Um, yes, that's what she was just going through. What I... Chair, and, and I'm not sure if um, Commissioner Nissen is, is is here, but the this, I'm not sure if Togozile is part of our team or part of uh, the their hands. Chair, I'm not sure if they're for me or for what. No, leave those are legacy hands. Oh, legacy hand. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So and. He, the terminologies, of course, I think may have been somehow missed, like we may have used certain words interchangeably within our, our presentation. But the essence is this, the people we speak to as people who should be um, regulated in terms of the legislation, but who are unable to access um, or fulfill those legislative requirements. And those are the people who are criminalized. Those are the people who said in our report that they are unable to then uh, engage meaningfully and sufficiently in order to provide for their families because of the, uh, how difficult it is to access the legislative regimes. That's chairperson, and, uh, and I don't want to go into too many of the other questions because Komiya Sebanyoni or Nissen may want to deal with those. But that was, I think, was the most important one for me. And I suppose there's something else now that someone wants me to specifically address. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's on you. The platform is yours. Mm, you, yeah, I'm, I'm, any, anyone now, I'm, I assume, uh, that uh, will come, will come through, through, through you. We can't limit people that you want to bring in to provide answers where possible. No, it was just the two of us. Oh, so the commissioner is also here. Uh, commissioner? <laughs> Honorable Chair, may I come through you onto the platform? Now you come through, Mr. Marong, because we don't want to, point to, to yes, we don't want to to appoint to, to point at people, and then you are told that person is not ours. I only point at the honourable members of the committee. Those are the ones that I will have a right to 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 to, to point. But you can go ahead, uh, Commissioner. Commissioner Nissen can come through. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Hongo. Mr. Hongo, I just want to make a few general um, remarks, and I hope through that we will be able to answer some of the questions that were raised by the honourable members. As uh, Commissioner Sivanyone said, I have been to the Northern Cape, but it's not the first time. I've been many other areas as well. Let me just say, first of all, with the artisanal um, uh, mining and artisanal mining should not only be on mining the mine dumps because that is, I think, what sometimes 
we just lead the artisanal miners too to be mining mine dams, particularly if you look at the Northern Cape and you look at the uh, of alluvial plus the marine mining dam, mining uh, diamond mining, that is always opportunities because it's always on open surface and uh, uh, mining that can happen. And then the second thing I want to say is agree, Chair, that you know not all artisanal miners and not all foreign nationals are criminals in, in this case. But however, we do have major problems. If you look at Port Norris in terms of the domination of one group and people are now even in their own houses digging holes because there's the belief that everywhere they are mining my, uh, diamonds. And so they just take in the yard, in the houses, all over the show, and dominated by one group. And again, like Clancia, again, there's also another group of foreign nationals that are dominating and causing a lot of problems like beginning of this year and last year, people killed, injured and killed in clashes between the locals and the uh, non-nationals. Uh, Chair, so those are the kind of issues that we face. But I think, Chair, the elephant in the room is the fact that, and I think members have mentioned this, that the non-rehabilitation, now non-rehabilitation has got two legs. The one leg is the environmental one in which the mines are just left like that. And the second leg is even if the mining company does build a clinic or a school or a preschool, the, the, the sustainability of that is non-existent because they then just leave the area. And I do think that the relevant authorities, in this case, the department, should hold those companies accountable because in the event of non-reputation and the sustainability of the social responsibility compact, that we find a lot of issues in terms of people just being worse off before the mine started in that particular area. The third thing I would like to raise, Jefferson, and, and, and please, I, I'm, I'm putting it as bluntly as I, as I can, is that you see, because a number of the mining companies and the mining bosses, because of the, um, the fact that they are connected politically, they just do whatever they want to. And I'm generalizing. There are mining companies that are very responsible both towards the environment and towards the social economic compact that they've made. But many times it's just a, a blatant uh, ignoring their responsibility post a decommissioning of a mine. And then lastly from our side, Chairperson, yes, the Human Rights Commission maybe has not been that vigilant in terms of making sure that, um, that, that we should exercise our, our powers but look to our powers, our oversight, our monitoring and our protection mandate. And certainly, sir, thank you for that invitation that we should come along. The last point I want to make, Chairperson, is that, yes, I mean, inequality, unemployment and poverty has created a lot of problems for us. And, you know, in, and it's not the mining industry only or that needs to resolve the, these kind of three things, it's all of our responsibility, but perhaps from outside as the Human Rights Commission, including us answering the question about Yachas Fontaine is uh, where the dam burst and our people are, uh, 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 they have been exposed to the calamity which they did. It is also about the department's oversight from inspectors to everybody. Commissioner Nissen, we, we seem to have lost you. So being open and, and not hide behind, um, you know, uh, political. Uh, you are muted, Commissioner Nissen. Unmute yourself, please. And, but that is that if our people were living, it's like somebody that said to me, there's the origin. In mining okay. community, saying we are the workers and in the end we don't benefit from it. Chair, those are my general comments, but I accept that the, the, the challenges that you put out and members have put out to the Human Rights Commission, and we will certainly make work of it. Thank you, Chair.
Uh, Chairperson, I'm not sure if there's another one of our members who'd like to come in. Commissioner Banyoni, I heard you in. I see on the chat it says our CEO is now in. I'm not sure if we've dealt with all the questions or the rest of the team wants to add something. I guess I take it no one of the Thank team wants to Sorry, Chair, but the CEO is on now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good mo good afternoon, uh, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Honourable Members, uh, Commissioners and colleagues. I'm sorry for all of the trouble. Um, for some reason, our system uh, went into a protection mode and wouldn't recognize Zoom. I am joining now on my phone. Uh, my, my apologies for that. I also wanted to share with the committee briefly, and this uh, touches, if I may, some of the questions that uh, uh, honorable members posed to us, but also some of the information they shared with the commission. I think perhaps to share with the committee that for instance, um, our teams are on the ground since yesterday uh, in the free state uh, monitoring. But as our, our commissioner indicated, we will then do three things. The first is to monitor the humanitarian situation and how we can unlock emergency support to people who are, have been affected. Secondly, to take the monitoring information and intervene with other organs of state so that we can have some reforms unlocked of a more immediate uh, and uh, short-term nature. But thirdly, then to offer to support uh, those people who may need assistance uh, of a different type, uh, whether it be legal or some other form of uh, um, redress that we may be able to support with. So, so really, that that is what is in progress right now in free state, and this will happen uh, despite the court judgment. Uh, it will not attempt in any way to usurp the authority of the court, but rather to uh, intervene and provide humanitarian support where the human rights are being rendered vulnerable. Then to say that our chairperson, in fact, uh, has already attended at, at Kruger's drop and brought back uh, some information. Uh, at that point, it was also important for the commission to uh, encourage people to cohere together and to diffuse any um, uh, uh, vulnerable situations that may have been uh, starting to percolate in the area, uh, causing more tensions and instability. Um, our chairperson, I think, uh, attended in Kruger's drop um, not too long after the horrific events that uh, brought uh, this area into our line of sight. Um, that said, uh, honorable chair and committee members, I think, an important message that the Human Rights Commission wants to um, draw to the attention of the committee and comes on the back of, of this report, which is actually quite outdated and worryingly so because the, the comments we make there have, have not yet found full favor um, and, and full implementation. But to say that rape and crime is not isolated in our country to this area to this group or to that group. It's pervasive. Uh, the GBV, our president, has, has claimed to be the second pandemic. Um, and so we should take pains not to confine this pandemic to a particular area or particular group um, and to uh, you know, a particular kind of narrow focused um, uh, assessment. The report we thought appropriate to bring to the attention of this committee now again is largely because it explores the wider human rights dimensions and it, it recognizes that we all need to look at this more closely beyond just uh, legislative or regulatory reforms, but to understand the social nature of who is the Zama Zama, what drives them. Uh, we use that term colloquially, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, what drives them? What is their makeup? Uh, you know, how is this unfolding? Do they work in isolation or, for instance, 
uh, are South Africans complicit and enabling as well, but uh, unspoken and unseen, invisible? Uh, are minds that find operating um, to the formal process too costly actually in any way enabling it? Is there any kind of, of enablement going on? Um, you know, what is the cost to us economically? What are we losing? We looked at during this hearing, this was way back when this first hearing was, was conducted. We looked at the case models in Asia, South America, in the Pacific. We looked at East and West Africa closer to home in the research to, to, that, that allowed us to explore whether uh, this can be brought into a more regulated scenario. This can have uh, better conditions applied that may mitigate against some of the consequences we are seeing where there are power struggles between uh, communities and those who wish to continue to have their businesses um, operating. So in the view of the commission way back then, we already recognized that this was a complex situation, that some of them may actually not want to be regulated or recognized. They would prefer then to, to operate you know, in the shadows. And so the commission having recognized that back then was encouraging this kind of close social research, but also regional research, the benchmarking and, and the reflection on what we could bring back home that could work for us, uh, but also work to support our economy. Um, and you know, the classification of illegal also needs to be reflected, not because it's not illegal, but because is it illegal because the, the doer is illegally here, or the tools and implements have been illegally obtained, or because it is being conducted outside of the regulatory framework uh, that is applicable to small-scale and artisanal mining. So we need we need to reflect quite closely on how that is. Thirdly, there is this need for awareness. Um, it would be very problematic if we allowed certain st stereotyping to be perpetuated. Uh, not because uh, what communities have told us is untrue, but because it is true, but it is not confined in our country, in our situation, to a particular group of people or particular people of social origin or from a particular sector. It's widespread. TBV is widespread in our country. And, and so we should guard against the messaging that we send out, but also positively, we should do more to create awareness. And certainly from the perspective of the commission, um, our more recent hearings around the impacts of mining to mining affected communities, we think again, takes a very deep um, human rights based look into what is the situation with mining communities. And we were grateful then for the very high level interministerial committee that was convened on the back of that hearing report that was to have engaged with the commission on how we could take uh, those recommendations forward. And unfortunately, there, there were just two meetings um, with the department, uh, DGs were present, uh, uh, the minister, some ministers were present as well. And that interaction was very, very encouraging but COVID then got the better of all of us and um, uh, nothing further happened beyond the two meetings of that uh, task team to take forward the recommendations. So uh, chairperson and committee members, I think there is an appetite by the Human Rights Commission certainly to continue to support the work of parliament. Uh, indeed, even in the provinces uh, to be able to share with them our reports, investigations and findings, but also to engage with the department as we have been doing and other departments around how we can work more constructively on these issues uh, going forward. Uh, but yeah, that, that was it from myself. Um, and we, we would be quite willing to, to um, receive requests uh, from parliament um, that propose to us how it is we may better support um, at any time, and we will attempt to do so. Uh, insofar as the, the monitoring is concerned, I think the commission too is quite uh, resource constrained. One, uh, just in terms of boots on the ground and the number of people we have, 
to be able to to monitor where in fact labor inspectors or um, environmental uh, rights inspectors uh, are able to do so. Um, but we also have uh, uh, limitations on the level of technical expertise we have, particularly in the extractive industries, for instance. So well, we, we, we do limit what we can do to systemic matters where we try to assist by drilling down into the human rights implications and then support the work of other organs of state and um, uh, C9 bodies. Uh, thank you, Chairperson and uh, members of, of the committee, commissioners and colleagues. I hope are you done, uh, Human Rights Commission. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson and honorable members. We are done once more. We say thank you for the opportunity that the Portfolio Committee has given the South African Human Rights Commission. <clears throat> and uh, having said that, as the Chapter 9 uh, institution, uh, we want to assure the honorable members of the Portfolio Committee that we will uh, continue to implement our uh, mandate and also in uh, as the parting shot i would like to say as as the chapter nine institution one of the chapter nine institutions as well as you the uh, parliamentarians we are serving the same community we are serving the same constituency that is why among others we are proposing that there should be a committee during in which we've got to discuss these issues going forward. The preamble of the Constitution, I want to paraphrase it when it says, among others, we therefore adopt this Constitution as the supreme law of the Republic, so as to establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights not to forget our mandate in terms of section 184 uh, subsection uh, 3 which says that each year the south african human rights commission must require relevant organs of the state to provide the commission with information on the measures that they have taken towards the realization of the rights in the bill of rights it names all the rights concerning housing, healthcare, food, water, social security, education, and environment. Thank you very much, Chairperson and Honorable Members of the Portfolio Committee. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, uh, the South African Human Rights Commission. Um, uh, Babu Subanyone and uh, your CEO. I just wanted to say your CEO must, uh, must relax. At least uh, she came to an invited meeting. The problem is when the invitee has a problem to participate in, in his or her meeting. And uh, that's, what, that's what happened to this chairperson. So uh, I should be the one who's making an apology, not, not, not her. Uh, I, I had my own issues at the start of the of the meeting, but I had to devise mechanism. On that note, thank you very much. Look, I think um, the first thing we must say that we will have to do, we have got a duty. You came to us, uh, both yourselves and um, the AGSA, we have a duty to do follow-ups in particular to the department and its entities, if needs be, to account on the issues that have been brought to our attention. And if it needs to be ready, uh, we may also uh, ensure that uh, you are also part of such a meeting so that if there are immediate responses to be made, you, you can be able to respond on the spot. But we take it that we have brought this to our attention, uh, that uh, the fact is the concern. It's not the correctness or accuracy of the concerns, it's the concerns raised 
or the, the, the need to respond on certain issues with the speed that is required. But let me say this, um, your commissioner raised an issue. I hope that's not what we'll be confronted with when we go to the issue of uh, Jachas Fondain uh, with regards to whether some people find themselves having high privileges by virtue of political connectedness. I, I, I don't know. Uh, safe to say that um, the first thing I think is critical for me is that there are many aspects on this issue of illegal mining and that uh, we're grappling with. Amongst other things, for instance, beside the court order with regards to the Chahas Fontaine, because the court order meant literally that uh, the Department of Mineral Resources has got no jurisdiction on the matter. And you will recall only through the mineral, the mineral and petroleum resources development act, which is the MPRDA, uh, mining rights and licensing in general can be made in the mineral and industry, mineral uh, industry space. This actually meant that the a private entity would have had a privilege of now passing over. A, a, a issuing the mining right without the due regulation of the state, um, which is a very awkward thing that uh, we wouldn't understand. It may not necessarily be the courts that would have made that. The only concern, I think, also when we engage as honorable members will arise is where shouldn't our own department have appealed that particular decision? because there is an, a, an, um, an, an existing case study, which was the ruling that was made in favor of the department when it was taken to court by the, by the industry, that they have got no right on the minerals beneath the soil. The court made the ruling that uh, the department and the state remains the custodian of ownership of the minerals beneath the soil on behalf of the people. The question of surface rights does not necessarily equate to the, 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 the issue of the mineral rights. So that is the, the issue that turns out at the end of the day we have to deal with. How do we make sure that a decision of this nature by the courts does not put us in a similar situation? But besides that, I think there are many other aspects when it comes to the issue of the derelict and ownerless mind, including also the need on the current existing mines. I think one of you, you from you, the Human Rights Commission made an example about people who are um, digging in houses. That's what we observed in, um, in, um, in, uh, in what is this place in, 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 in Bergersford, mainly and the Stairport, where Literally, mining is taking place at the doorstep and behind the houses themselves. And that proposes a serious legacy problem in future, where those uh, the dams would make it so difficult to, uh, for the residents to preside. And we have said we have to, that uh, disaster has to be attended now because it's going to lead us again to the same situation of the religion ownerless minds. No one will take ownership of rehabilitating those uh, those 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 those, those um, uh, excavations. So we need to look at that. There is also an issue that we are looking at in terms of the legislative framework. If you look at um, the Kruger Stop case and many other cases, including in entities like uh, areas like Lily Mine today that we are sitting with, is the issue of the lack of harmony within legislation, which is what we said we needed to do, because some of those legislation falls outside the ambit of this committee. When a person receives the mining right, he gets the mining right through the conditions and the regulations as prescribed in the MPRDA. But when they are faced with serious challenges, then they go through the roots of the insolvency uh, procedure as far as the Companies Act is concerned. And that then makes a problem because for quite a long time, those mines will remain non-operational for a long time. 
and uh, therefore become an attraction for others to conduct illegal activities. And that is why we've said there is a need to reconsider a harmonized legislation and the principle of use it or lose it must apply so that no one can keep a mining right and uh, we are confronted with this situation. But also considering using what we call, although it may not be the proceeds of crime, but if something is in the public interest, we think the state must have an, an, an authority over over such and, um, and 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 I don't want to use the word expropriate, but people will have a problem. But we're saying just if it becomes almost similar to the proceeds of crime, then the state must must find a way to 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 intervene in that situation. So I think that uh, as we will call the department to account, we will also see you as um, trying to assist and complement her to the work that we are performing. We don't see ourselves as opponents or as people who are just sitting, monitoring, and so forth, what we do. We will continue to see you, especially in the absence of enough resource capacity uh, in the legislature. We will see in terms of the operations, uh, operational activities and monitoring systems as part of the extension of what this committee can tap from. So on that note, thank you very much. Um, you, 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 if you feel like, but this remains still a meeting of the committee. You are released, though. Uh, we thank you very much. We will return back in terms of what then uh, from now onwards will be the case going forward. Thank you very much. Yeah, it will be amiss if I don't thank my colleague, Commissioner Chris Nissen, as well as my research assistant, Advocate Mu. Hongo, as well as our CEO. And uh, lastly, but not at least, my daughter who warned me that from Chefo Talk there will be load shedding in our area and who devised some means to say that there is a way of staying connected by a router. With he, her assistance, I was able to continue being connected even now when we are in load shedding. Thank you. Once more, Chairperson. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, AG, also for 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 your for your submission. We will also return back to your side. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, honourable co uh, co colleagues, uh, Commissioner Sibanyone, CEO, and all our colleagues. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Members, Commissioners, and colleagues from the Commission. Thank you. Okay. Now let's let's go to the next item. Um, Ara, Ari and Ayanda, the correspondence. Am I correct? That's correct, Chair. Yes. Sorry, Chair. Sorry, yes. Chair. It's Kivesh from the Auditor General's Office. Can we be excused now, sir? Yes, that's what I said long time ago. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Keep okay. well. Okay. Sure, okay. thank Bye. you. Bye. Yes, Ari? And I am? Uh, okay, Chair. I've got a challenge with load sharing too, but I'll try to flight if I can the correspondence. But I sent to members what we received in terms of correspondence. Um, first one, Chair. Chair, can I can I just go through them and then if members got a problem, we'll we'll do it because I'm 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 struggling to connect to to share it. The first correspondence, Chair, is from Opre Langa. He needs an intervention from the Mineral Resources and Energy Committee and the Committee on Agriculture about the failure of the provincial rural development that involves Ivan Platz and Anglo Platz. I'll just, uh, I won't read the whole letter, just highlight what the, 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 the correspondence is all about. And then the second one is coming from the office of the speaker, from the report from Alta that She's saying that we must deal with it in whatever way 
we deemed it necessary as a committee. And then uh, the third letter chair that we attached, I don't think it should form on this one, but actually it's the comment from the Minister of Mineral of Environment that was commenting on the bill, which we advertised. But basically, he gave, she gave us his, uh, her input, but also citing that he's got a problem with the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy of not involving what they've discussed and come up with on. And then the last one, Chair, there's an ATC that was, um, I think it's Thursday's ATC last week, that was withdrawing the gas amendment bill. It is withdrawn from the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy. So the gas amendment bill is no longer in Parliament. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Honorable members. Yeah, oh, I thought of Honorable members, that's the correspondence. You forgot the other one. We will also talk, although it's not written in black and white, we'll also talk on the issue of the Jahas Fontaine um, based on the on the engagements that we, one has received. Um, can we, one, just put the first one, I can't open it off, uh, but I think I do have it myself. I can't open the one of Honorable Langa. Not not Obri Langa, not Leon Singh Honorable now, from Mr. Langa. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you allow the chair of the portfolio committee to interact with the chair of uh, rural development um, and see what interventions can they make with regard to, because the issues is raising are more operational. What, um, what interventions can be made, including uh, dealing with the department? Will they, can uh, honorable members uh, are, are, are feel comfortable with that? Any comment on that one? Agreed, Chair. Okay. <laughs> the the second one of outer, can we agree that? Um, at the, we'll find time, appropriate time, allow outer to come and raise all, like we did with the Human Rights Commission, AGSA, and also allow outer to share their concerns or, 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 or yes, um, as they've written to the speaker, and we will then prioritize that because any correspondence from the speaker gets forwarded to to this committee. So can we, do we agree that we will find space for outer to add their, their concerns in terms of the issues that relate to this committee? Any take? Agreed, Chair. Thank you very much. There is no opposition to that. Lastly, on the correspondence from the Minister of um, Minister of uh, Environment, Forestry and Fisheries, can you agree that we will table that um, correspondence from the Minister when we deal with the upstream petroleum resources development bill, but also we forward the letter to the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy for the attention of the Minister? Do I agree, honorable members? Agree, agree. Can you say that again, Chair? I'm saying when we deal with the back the bill, when we deal with the bill on um, um, upstream petroleum resources development bill, we will table this letter first. Then subsequently. In the meantime, we will also forward the letter for the attention of the department, specifically for the attention of the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy, for his attention also. Two person. Honorable Marshal. Okay. I, I, I think we can do that. However, we need to note that uh, when the we, we 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 as parliament are only 
advertising it so that we have views from the public. We are doing so mm. after, in terms of procedure, this bill has gone through cabinet. And we should also note that the author of the uh, letter is a minister who is a cabinet uh, member uh, writing to us, raising concerns about an issue that another cabinet minister has brought to the Portfolio Committee of Mineral Resources and Energy. Um, I, 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 I don't know whether in law or with our regulations in parliament, what the Minister of Environmental uh, Affairs has done is a correct way of going about it because we have two people who are sitting in the same meeting, but the other one writes something and complains about the other, the other one in another portfolio committee. To me, it doesn't make sense. And we do need legal services to tell us what is the, the way forward. And I'm, I'm not saying what we, 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 you are raising that we, we deal with it. The manner in which you want us to deal with is wrong. I'm just saying, let, let's on record note that uh, something is very wrong in the manner in which the uh, environmental affairs has done this thing. Thank you. Okay, Nana, I know that can that's what I was trying to talk about. Can we not go to the thing? I take note of one issue that I think we are still, we are correct, uh, Honorable Marshall. Uh, I am please um uh, the committee staff, let's 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 so that when we come to the committee, we already have a legal opinion on on what do you do on cases of this nature. It is very unique, usually. I agree with you on that, but that's why I was saying when we deal with the bill itself, less than table those issues, including the concerns that you know. From where I'm sitting under normal circumstances, you will expect a portfolio committee, maybe the chair writing to the other chair and say, please note, as the portfolio committee on one, two, three, we have an interest on this matter because it also related affects what we think is I think that in terms of oversight responsibility, we have a duty on. That is why also we say we can't keep this letter when it talks about a colleague uh, or counterpart. Uh, we will refer it exactly to the minister because it also talks about uh, the executive authority concern. Then probably by the time we sit as a committee, including what you are suggesting, we will have had a, 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 base, a base from which we move from in terms of the dis discussion. Can you agree on that, honorable members, with the addition of a referral, also requesting a, an opinion from the legal services? Even if they don't come, just in writing. Is that agreed, honorable members? Oh, anyway, Honorable Marshall was not saying no, I was saying he actually accepts that. And he was just adding and also saying we must note the issues that are unfamiliar. On that note, can we now go to the issue of Jahas Fonden? Honorable members, let me say I have had engagement with the House Chairperson, uh, including the Chief Whip. The, the view is that this committee will have to pay a visit to Chakas Fontaine. Um, but uh, it was clear uh, that's what, uh, from where I sit as a chair, I said it's going to be impossible to go tomorrow or any other day, except if we consider Friday. The reason is that we can't go there, come back, and then come and then go back uh, late Friday. So I had requested in the meantime the staff to check on logistic. And uh, the suggestion which uh, uh, I would say it is agreed uh, from the uh, house chairs is that uh, the, we go uh, on Friday to Yachas Fondain, 
and then we go back to join us back uh, after that and continue with the work that we are doing. It means instead of starting Saturday, we start on Friday. In terms of logistics, uh, that's why I hope the staff we can uh, share, is that uh, instead of flying on Friday, we fly late Thursday or any time where we can get flights and then members where they are supposed to participate in the uh, late session of um, the, the NA. They just logged in virtually. And then uh, early morning, uh, I don't know logistically, we fly to Bloemfontein because job they say will be too, too far. We fly to Bloemfontein and then go to Yachazfontein and then come back straight to Johannesburg. That is the issue we thought we must share with uh, honorable members. The issue of the technicality with regards to who is supposed to be preside to be having an authority, the view is that the fact of the matter is that there was a mining activity. It will take us going there and then bring back the report, including what we have been receiving on the sites that uh, there is that court order with regards to the uh, the the authority over the, the mining tag. That is the issue, honorable members. Uh, is there any addition, uh, Ayanda or, or Makubalo? Uh, no, there are no addition. You reported it correctly. As you have said that we live on Thursday, but the, what I can bring up, Chair, there's a challenge with flight. So for now, depending as you, you did it informally with the principals, they need to sign it out. We have prepared the application now, which must they must sign it so that we can release the flight. But the intention is to leave on Thursday. We sleep, we fly to Joburg, sleep in Joburg, take the first flight at 20 past six from Joburg to Blomfandain, arriving at 20 past seven, and then we'll drive to Jaffa's Fontaine, work there. When we're done, we drive back to Joburg so that we sleep and start the following day in Vancom for the illegal mining. Thank you, Chair. Okay, that's information, honorable members. Okay. Hi, Chair. Chair. Oh. Chair. Anna, let, let's give Makubalo and then we'll come to yeah, Makubalo. Uh, morning, members. Chairperson, I've already booked the flights for all members. We ma I managed to change the tickets last night. Um, members will be flying. They can, they can check their SMSs. They are all flying on Thursday. I managed to change them except Mr. Zungula because he will be flying from uh, East London. I wanted him to confirm if is he going to be able to fly on Thursday and what time. There were no cost implications on the tickets that Okay, thank you, thank you, Makubalo. Uh, Mamaling. Thank you. the flight. I will go back. I will the back. I will go back. I will go back. I will go back. I will go I will go back. I will Okay, I I was uh, I was about to say can uh, on a, um Ms. Mema Kubalo change our Friday flight to Thursday if that yes, is that's... doable. But but she says that has been done already. Okay. Yeah. Any other matter? Yes, Chair. Yes, Honorable Lange. Yes, uh, greetings, Chair and colleagues and the staff. No, Chair. Um. I just wanted to check uh, on this one of the authority. You know, uh, uh, I couldn't he really get you clearly, you know, um, uh, as in on your explanation around the authority. Because when we went to Polo One, uh, Chair, uh, there was challenges around, uh, we encountered encounter challenges around uh, authority. So as is, we ended up not being able to go into the mine. 
So uh, I just need to check with this one if uh, we weren't able to get anything maybe from DMRE because uh, it's very likely, again, if uh, uh, somebody else uh, stops us from the gate and they tell us that we do not have authority. So uh, somehow I think it's important that we get that brief around the authority. No, no, no. The, the issue is that already the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy is going there, uh, is there today. So it goes without saying that uh, the issue of uh, taking responsibility, we will only come with, that's the, that's the issue we're told, only come back uh, with the confirmation uh, of what is, uh, is, at, is at hand. The, the, the point is, it's not that there is, there, is no, there is no authority for the committee to do its oversight work. The court order, that's what we're told, the court order says the DMRE has got no authority over mine dams. Hence, the transaction was done outside the DMRE uh, with regards to this. But many people have been there. It can't be only the portfolio committee. So if the minister is there, it actually means this committee equally is, 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 is the same. It conducts oversight over the executive authority in the field where we are. So if, if that issue arises, it's a matter that we wouldn't understand. You can't allow the department, and then you don't allow a portfolio committee of parliament in any way. A portfolio committee of parliament, if it is released by parliament to go and perform its task, no individual can stand on its way. But let's leave that one off fair because there is a different, there's a different view. The truth of the matter is that there, uh, in from where I'm sitting, but when we deal with those things, I'm sure it will be clear. There we were failed by the DMRE. It was a risk going in. They didn't do what they were supposed to do in terms of prior uh, exercise uh, in, in, in going in there. They never gave us a proper briefing and the challenges. We only confronted challenges that they could have preempted long before, uh, including inspection of the area as far as uh, health and safety is concerned. So the, that, that, that was the issue. No one can do that. They would not have stopped us in terms of the law to perform what we're supposed to do. <clears throat> Is there any other matter, honorable members? Can I say uh, those honorable members, um, uh, like we said, must check if uh, they were only ready for Friday, they can all, they can make it on Thursday. Please uh, alert the staff as early as possible so that your ticket is not changed to Thursday, only to find out that you are not available on that Thursday. You are only available uh, on Saturday and Sunday, uh, or you are available for traveling on Friday instead of Thursday. Is there any other matter? Uh, no, thanks, Chair. Yes, I have my yes, hand Chair. Up. Yes. Chair? Yes, yes Mam Paul. And I had my hand up, but we have since clarified the issue, so I think it's best that I don't raise it here. I will then pick it up with the support staff. OK. Thanks. Honorable Malinga? Chairperson, uh, yes. I see. I see that the time of the flights is during a plenary. Are we allowed now to take oversight visits during plenary? Honorable Malenga, you are granted the time to go. I can't speak on behalf of the House Chairpersons. The point I raised, I said, some of the members may have to log in during the period and attend virtually. If it is during the, the time, the, let's deal with that issue on the side. I can't say now, sitting here, that yes, you can, you can do that. We are instructed by the leadership of parliament that we must go and pay visit to that area. We'll only deal with the matter as and when we are alerted that you can't do this at this time. Yes, we granted you to go, but we can't, you can't go at the times that you have taken. But it also goes with the emergency that also is related to the situation. I don't think it doesn't, it, it's just a blanket approach that does not take into consideration that this is an emergency matter. It's not a normal uh, activity that we should, be, we should be undertaking. 
if foreign science were going to shift and say we're going on Thursday because we're going for illegal mining, when we know that we could have traveled at a better date, that is why the normal activities are on a Saturday and Sunday. Is there any other matter on this, honorable members? No, 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 I'm agitated, honorable Maling. I'm never that type of a person. Relax. Um, let's uh, is there any any other matter, honorable members? Okay. In the absence of that, um, oh, Ari is asking for a caucus with uh, the men court team. You are, the meeting is adjourned, uh, honorable members. So, come on, please don't go. Okay, I was about, sure, sure. I was about to ask that. Thank you. <laughs>